actually really like that song now I've got a bit of regret I gave up two tickets to that concert on Saturday night I know my other half at one point in time decided to stay online and he bought four tickets for the cost of two thousand dollars I thought oh good grief so I said no 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 sell off two and take one of the kids etc and now I've seen all that and I keep seeing this picture and keep hearing the music now I wish I'd gone I've got regret but that's all right we're here today for resurgence and this last the last third of the day. This afternoon, we would love you to come and enjoy some drinks with us. All right. The only way you get to come and have drinks with us, though, is if you're staying for the panel session at the end. All right. So I'll lock the door. I'm going to put a little tag on you. And if you're staying in here, then you can come out and have a drink. Otherwise, uh, and tomorrow afternoon, we're due, you can see in your program, it says down there that we should be finishing about three o'clock. So we are having our Christmas drinks here and we would love you to join us for that as well. So there'll be food and there'll be drinks and we have lots of our different clients here. So not just those of us who are here for resurgence, but from our clients that have joined us all the way through the year in delegates. So please stay and take advantage of Stewie's success this year uh, by enjoying a few drinks and the opportunity to chat up, to, um, catch up with some different people because it's all about networking as well. Dr. Martin Ralph, sir, would you like to come up and join us? Watch the way this man approaches the stage. Look at this. Up he comes. What do you think he does? What do you think his pastime is, this fellow here? He's from Edith Cowan Uni. He's obviously, you know, fairly well, fairly well um, uh, educated. And last week, he spent last week as the opening bowler for the Western Australian Veterans Cricket Team slaying the rest of the nation <laughs> <Slaying>. <laughs> did we actually win uh we won two lost two and just missed out on run rate from playing in the final so oh geez, yeah. okay all right <laughs> it's lucky i was thinking to myself when we were talking about early lucky you weren't playing this week because everyone would have passed out it would not have been a great week so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about radiation in mines and it was interesting because when i got here today and i've been walking around talking with some of our exhibitors there's a lot of rocks out there at this particular conference. So rather than the giveaways, no, but usually, Peter, there's like giveaways and things. And this week, there's loads of rocks. Actually, it was at your table because your wife pointed out there's a section there and she said, oh, don't touch that, it's radioactive. Well, that's interesting because often you see these rocks, especially in the uranium field, oh, that's radioactive, don't go near it. So our good doctor here is going to give us a talk about radioactivity in mines. Would you please make him welcome, everyone? <laughs> Thank you so much, Chrissy, and thank you to RIU and Vertical Events for the opportunity. A technical guy in an investor forum. This is um, something a little bit different, but hopefully not too painful for you. A quick disclaimer, there are some in the audience that might recognise me. I actually do hold a, a senior position with the Mine Safety Regulator. Uh, today's presentation is entirely about my PhD thesis and should no way be taken to reflect the views of the, uh, the regulator. Quick start off on something technical, and that is um, when we're talking about radiation and radioactivity exposure to workers, there are three principal exposure pathways by which um, workers can receive doses. The first one, very simple, very straightforward, is exposure to gamma rays, which are electromagnetic radiation, very similar to X-rays, easy to measure, easy to detect. Then we actually start talking about internal radiation, and that is in, um, radiation that's inhaled. And there are two primary sources the first one is inhalation of long-lived alpha particles that are contained in radioactive dusts, two orders of magnitude more complex to, to, uh, to measure, and in terms of assessing the doses, even more difficult from that perspective. The third path is something called radon and radon progeny. Uh, the uranium miners in the audience would be very familiar with this, but radon progeny is also extremely difficult to measure and doing dose estimates are very difficult. Why are these important? Well, we're celebrating 30 years since a, a watershed paper was published by Steinhausler that said that in the past, the extraction of uh, minerals and mineral processing is the largest um, source of exposure to norms or naturally occurring radioactive materials um, in any sector, and that an excess of cancer incidents and or respiratory system illness is prevalent in the mining sector as a result of exposure to naturally occurring radionuclides. So the investors in the, in the space I just want to paint a picture for you. It is well known, right, that 
WA is replete in uranium reserves. It's just a case of they haven't been exploited as yet. Some in the room may well be wanting to change that. Um, but is it also known that we are the world's largest mineral sand producer and every single mineral sands product is radioactive? It might also come as a surprise to you that at this stage there are 47 known deposits of monazite, which contain high levels of uh, um, radionuclides. 10 deposits of xenotime, which is also radioactive, with similar um, componentry as a monazite. Many of these, as you can see in the green circles, overlay our base metal mines, and we've got no data about radiation exposure to workers in the base metal mines. Um, and of course, they are significant sources of rare earth elements as well. And this is where the future of the state seems to be going in the rare earth sector. Might come as a surprise to you. Uh, we big hype about lithium projects in the state. I haven't found one yet that's not associated with um, uranium or radium contaminated groundwater. And some in the audience must just write me a letter of thanks at some stage for insisting that they do baseline groundwater monitoring. So we saved them uh, eons of spend in the future trying to fix up what was a natural occurrence. And then lastly, there are four, what I would call hot topics that any one of which um, could cause sufficient tension in amongst the left-leaning folk um, to cause issues for where you think that the future may lie. I want to put challenge, challenges up to you, and my first challenge is this. When I joined the department, even though this isn't their view, but in my research, there were seven projects across the state that were designated as radiation-related projects. That was in 2019. 2023, year to date, there's now 52. As you can see on the board there, 168 ASX listed WA based companies that have got rare earths in their portfolio. 54 at my last count in um, late March this year had got boots on the ground. And most of our earth deposits, with perhaps the exception of the Esperance jurisdiction that contain naturally occurring radionuclides, some of which are actually using thorium as an indicator of mineralization. So why the fuss? Well, currently, the, the limit for radiation workers, and let's not get hung up on the units, but let's get hung up on the number, is 20 millisieverts per year. Published data around the world, globally accepted, is that risks that arise uh, from exposure, chronic exposure to naturally occurring radionuclides, give one um, solid tumour production per 20,000 per millisievert. Um, and when one takes that to the limit, that means the risk of tumour formation at 20 millisieverts which is one in a thousand. That level of risk by all international standards is intolerable. So there's a driver to keep doses lower than 20 millisieverts where we can. I also point out here too, that the dose limit for members of the public is one millisievert per year. And that becomes important in a couple of slides later. So my research findings. Through the 1980s, well, our mineral sands industry started in the late 60s and really hit a head of steam in the 1970s. But the highest dose that was recorded in that time was 165 millisieverts to a worker. And the mean dose to 270 workers in industry was 31 millisieverts. Compare that, if you will, to the 20. Yep. 80% of the dose was delivered by radioactive dusts. And at that stage, radon and radon and thoron and radon progeny were not measured. They weren't included in those dose estimates. It becomes a bit scary when then you look at what the cancer risk is from that. But also during that time, we had a massive fallout in terms of community backlash to dumping of mineral sands products that had no commercial value. The town of Capel was labelled as the Maralinga of the Southwest. You can see that it actually made the press. And what I want to do is just quickly flash up for you the kind of hysteria that was generated in the 80s. Some of you may remember this, but I was a young person at this time, a radiation professional, and I spent six years of my life fixing this up. You don't want to see it happen again. This is the kind of stuff that we were inflicted at the time, right? There were people who had made it their, um, their election manifesto to actually rid the stuff of radiation. They were about what was going on with the science, but if it got them elected, that was the important thing. Also at this time as well, 11 houses were found to be contaminated in the town of Capel. There was a further 27 um, that were a bit more broader than that. Of those 11 houses, two of them actually had exposures to the residents of 35 millisieverts a year. 
35 times what the allowable limit is. But this was a problem that stemmed from the pre-processing of mineral sands products. And we're now about to do post-processing. I wanna just show you now, what does outrage look like in, in 2020? This is a quick extract from the Michael Moore production, you know, the Democrat, the left-leaning Democrat on the called Planet of the Humans. And if you haven't seen this, I'd urge you to have a look at this thing because it actually pulls apart the green movement, the green energy movement. It's got slammed a little bit in public, public media, the social media, but that's because you can't have a left-leaning person criticising what is a left-leaning initiative, right? Anyway, just, just have a look at what, how this goes. Electric cars, wind turbines, and solar panels use rare earth metals. And in fact, the rare earth mine is right up the street from here. <laughs> In mining these deep deposits, about 90% of what they pull up out of the ground contains uranium, thorium, and low level of other radionuclides. Radioactive waste that has to be disposed of somehow. They kind of turn it into a paste and spread it over the desert floor. Well, that's good for the desert, right? Yeah, the desert loves that. <laughs> <laughs> the idiocy in all of this, this absolutely cannot extend civilization's life. This relies on the most toxic and industrial processes that we've ever created. So to me, that looks like people in the 1980s. Sorry to draw the parallel, but that's, that's what we're facing if we don't get on top of this stuff. So challenge number two for you is that international authorities in the last five years have gone and revised the risk factors for radiation exposure. And these risk factors have made their way into, into Australian and Western Australian legislation. My PhD forecasts that as a result of those changes in risk factors, the doses that we reported in the 1980s would double as a result. The mean would be 55 millisieverts, nearly three times the, the exposure standard now. That maximum dose would sit between 250 and 300 millisieverts, which is 12 to 15 times the annual limit. And that's, that's all woolly, right? It, it, you know, look at that. But let's turn that into real risk, into cancer risk. That means that one in 65 workers at that level could be expected to develop cancer as a result. That is absolutely intolerable. And you will not win a workforce with those numbers, simple. And I'd like to point out that very little has changed in terms of the separation process in the mineral sands industry from the 1980s to now. The only difference is we're not producing monazite as a product anymore. And challenge number 2A that I've got here, this is a little graph of the contributions from gamma, long-lived alpha in dusts and radon progeny. And you'll notice now that about 25% of the of the doses delivered by radon progeny which we weren't measuring in the 1980s so that 250 to 300 could easily be 350 to 400 okay here's another challenge and this is the one that you all have to consider because the the school of, of social opinion is going to take this data and is going to ram it straight down the industry's throat first one is this is the expansion of the industry in terms of the number of radioactive um, sites up until 2019-20. So I haven't done this for the, the latest. You can see obviously an expansion of the industry. What's happened to the, the maximum dose reported by workers? It's gone up correspondingly. Correlation is not causation, but move to 50 sites. And if that trend follows, there, my friends, is where your issue is gonna lie. Second one here is, and again, you know, Minister of the Crown hates seeing this, is that this is the number of workers in the green bar in the industry. And again, it reflects where we've gone in terms of the massive expansion. This is the number of workers that are monitored in the industry for their personal dose. So despite a near doubling of workforce, we're only just back to the number of workers being monitored of a decade ago. You wanna tell me that's satisfactory? And when I show you this next curve, this is the percentage of workers that are monitored as a result of the total population. That decline does not paint the industry in a good paint a picture at all. Challenge number four, I call this explain this. So this is um, the maximum reported uh, radioactivity in dust across the sector. The red line, it, sorry, is the, is the activity of dust in concentration. The blue line is the dose. The green line is at the level at which um, doses will exceed 20 millisieverts. You can't have the average activity concentration going down 
and the average exposure going up. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I can tell you what the matter is, is we are simply not getting the number of samples that are needed to be statistically significant. In fact, whilst all this expansion has gone on, there has been a tenfold reduction in the number of samples collected across the industry. This is the stuff that you're going to be up against. Just, I put this slide up to let you know that we are servants to the international authorities as well, and that is the international requirements in terms of workers of today, the environment and workers of the future have got to be taken into account for the legislation. And that, that requirement has been put into a national code of practice, which we've, we have adopted in Western Australia. The adoption is covered under the new Work Health and Safety Mines regulations. Uh, it is world best practice regulation. I put my hand on my heart and say we are leading the world in terms of this stuff. What I can't put my hand on my heart and say is what's highlighted in the red there, and that is about radiation safety officers. And this is where I'd like to wrap up. Thanks, Chrissy. In 2006, the shortage of qualified radiation safety officers was identified as a major impediment by the uranium industry framework. Item two, item 4.1.1, it's there for all to see. It was actually one of the things that was gonna hold back the burgeoning industry at that stage. In 2007, an RIU conference, I went, hey, hey, everybody, look at this. You folks have got to start investing in people here because these folks have got massive jobs to get done. They've got to convince your stakeholders for a start. Importantly, they've got to be able to, on that last line there, provide technical advice to a level that will satisfy due diligence of a lot of different interested stakeholder groups. 2015, I repeated the message and said, look out folks, you know, you're up against it here because you can't fast track the development of these people. They have a degree in science, technology, engineering or maths. They need to have done 12 months working under the, um, the supervision of an established RSO. They need to do specialised courses and nowadays they have to sit exams and hold units of competency. As I said, this is the growth in terms of sites that are declared as radioactive sites or radioactive mining operations in the state from 19 up to 52 now. Unsurprisingly, I say their demand for radiation safety officers increased significantly. The numbers haven't increased significantly. We are in a labour market that is as tight as tight as can be. And all I can say to each of you is good luck in getting one, better luck in getting a good one. This is my, my research thesis. Um, I hope you'd find it a ripping read. I'd encourage you to download it and, <laughs> and have a look. But the full story is in there and naturally in a, in a 15 minute presentation, I can't cover off on a tenth of what we've done. But I hope I've at least whet your appetites for a little bit more information in the space. Chrissy, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Doctor. And you got me so well that I didn't even look at the timer. So yeah, I would actually, really, and the fact that you've been saying this for years and years and years, do you, do you foresee people actually listening to you in the future or not? Okay. Oh, it's interesting. Maybe we all need to start having that conversation as well and helping you out. Thank you very much. All right. Who's this fellow here now? I was a bit confused when I went looking for our next company. Uh, because I went looking because I was looking for a copy, correct? Ah, no. Yeah, it should be uh, Basin Energy 245. I know, it was you guys there. That's exactly right. So no. let's go in here, Basin. <laughs> and, uh, I've had a couple of issues with, because we've had some program changes, et cetera, because we've had people coming in from America or going, et cetera. So sure. let's go back. So Basin Energy is next up, Uranium Exploration and Development Company with an interest in three highly prospective projects positioned in the southeastern corner of margins of the world-renowned Athabasca Basin in Canada, which we heard about a little bit earlier when Siobhan was in here. Situated in Saskatchewan, uh, it's a globally attractive and proven mining jurisdiction, and it's renowned for unconformity type uranium. And how is Basin Energy going to fit into this? What are they doing and why are we going to jump on board with them instead of anyone else? Regardless, would you please make him welcome everyone? This is Peter Morehouse. Brilliant. Thank you, Chrissy. What a, what a great introduction. And we, uh, we'll run you through why Basin is a pretty exciting proposition and what we're up to in the Athabasca. Firstly, though, how brilliant. Not one, but two uranium power sessions. And it's just fantastic to see such a broad set of uranium projects being talked about. Very different value propositions. Um, but look, 
like many of the talkers you've heard, we've been in uranium for a long time, and it's great to see this focus back on this, back in the sector, and a real excitement and a budge, uh, a real excitement and a buzz. And look, we're only just getting started, guys. So, so watch this space. Um, from my perspective, it's fantastic to be able to have those guys go before because it means I don't have to cover off on the uranium macro. Uh, happily chat to you about it. Feel free to drop around the booth and I'll talk about it as a, for the rest of the conference. Okay, so Basin Energy, who are we? The disclaimer statement, feel free to come and talk to me. Um, Basin is a pure play uranium exploration company. We've been in existence for about 18 months. We IPO'd in October last year on the ASX, ticker code BSN. Currently sitting with a market cap of just over $10 million, and at the end of last quarter had a just over four in the bank. Important because we're fully funded and we have got a set of drilling starting in just a couple of months time. <clears throat> we are interests currently only in the Athabasca Basin. So Athabasca Basin, Northern Saskatchewan in Canada. Uh, this is home to uranium mining for some 65 years. It's been a top three producer of uranium globally for 45 of those. And with that, you get a really great jurisdiction to operate in. There's a clear framework to operate. There's a clear framework to explore. Is that working? All righty. Yeah, now, now I can really animate. <laughs> so look, the Athabasca Basin, as I said, a real pedigree to uranium exploration and to uranium mining. If you're exploring for any commodity at the moment in the Western world, you need that jurisdiction and certainty. But if you add uranium to that, it's critical. With that, you've got the likes of the Iranos and the Kamikos, so the world leaders operating in this part of the world. And as Siobhan said, a series of juniors who have had some phenomenal success over the last few years. Um, yeah, the basin, as she said, is completely pegged out now, and we're pretty proud of the holding we've got. Um, we've got a pretty solid scientific approach to our exploration, and I'll talk you through why and why we're a little bit different to some of our peers, uh, and why I think we've got a bit, of a, a bit of a leverage and some serious value proposition moving forward. Okay, so the Athabasca Basin, we're talking northern Saskatchewan, central Canada, right at the top. The basin is a sedimentary basin, which is shown in the outline on the screen above there. And all of these dots, the green and the whites, are major uranium deposits or uranium mines. For those of you less familiar with uranium deposits, we talk about grade, we talk about size, and every, a pound is not a pound. Every deposit has its merits, and quite clearly you can't just look at grade and size. I like to compare this with the big opportunities in Australia. Let's look at Cigar Lake there. So Scar Lake, 350 million pounds, sitting at about 16% uranium. We compare that to what we have in Australia. Uh, we can compare it to, say, Jabaluka, Northern Territory, standalone uranium asset, about the same size, 350 million pounds, but around 0.4%. Both very credible deposits. But you see, when you have this sort of grade and you have this sort of tonnage that the Athabasca uh, develops, uh, has, then you get some seriously economically viable projects. Our projects, we're going to talk to you mostly about the Geeky project, which is in the eastern side here. So that little blue dot is what Siobhan was talking about with GMZ earlier. And then the North Millennium project, which is just north of Cameco's Millennium Deposit as well. Okay, so this is a diagram I built back in, or we built back in 2012 when we were doing the Alligator Energy uh, talks about exploration. And what I've got and what I like to put in here is really value release from exploration uranium post Fukushima. So we've got time across the horizontal here, and each of these U's is a significant discovery. Even post Fukushima, when uranium has been down to $20 per pound, uh, 30, 40 bucks per pound, very little risk appetite for exploration, we still had some phenomenal value returns for shareholders. Uh, look at the work that uh, Denison have done with Griffin and Phoenix. Uh, look at what ISO have done with Hurricane, the world's the highest grade uranium deposit, about 50 million pounds, it's um, 30 odd percent. And I'll talk a little bit about Arrow shortly, but Arrow, uh, genuine greenfield exploration success from a $30 million market cap to a $4 billion plus company. And I know you'll hear some of the stories from next gen later in this session. That's why you're exploring this part of the world, guys. You explore to re release value and you're exploring places which can provide those exploration successes. Um, 
Okay, let's have a little bit of a geology lesson. And now this is directly relevant because it's, I believe this is why we're differentiated to some of our competitors. What we have here is a younger sandstone unit. So this is an unconformity, this contact between a younger sandstone and an older rock type. At that contact, the model has always been, this is where you get mineralization, and this is where the big deposits were originally found. But quite clearly, with 65 years of exploration, this contact has had a lot, a lot of drilling, and a lot of those opportunities have dried up now. The model was always drilled to it, drilled 20 meters past it, no grade, walk away. Uh, fast forward to Lee Curry and to Andy Brown when they went over with, with NextGen in 2010-11, and they said, look, we think there's a bit of a different target style here. We think there's something called basement target host, uh, basement host mineralization, similar to what we see in Northern Australia and some of the deposits there. Um, long story short, that was the discovery of Arrow. There's 200 meters between the contact and the top of their deposit. They need the right rock type, they need the right structure. Why does that matter to us? Well, you go and do an IPO, you raise a few million dollars, nine million bucks in our case, and you start chasing 1,000 meter deep drill holes, it gets very expensive and it gets very technically challenging. The implications of the Arrow discovery, and we're seeing it being, coming to fruition now with the likes of Siobhan and the team, is those rock types, which I talk about here, are actually at surface or just under some uh, shallow glacials on the eastern side of the project area, eastern side of the Athabasca Basin here. That means you've got the right rock types and the right structures for some of the major deposits of this part of the world that have come in completely overlooked because we didn't have this sandstone contact. You've got a little bit of cover over the top, enough to mask a big deposit, and it's in the top 100 or 200 meters of surface. So suddenly, geophysics starts to work. Drilling becomes a heck of a lot cheaper, and you've got a big, big holding. And that's the proposition we bring with the Geeky project, and that's gonna be the focus of the rest of the talk now. So basin, as I said, IPO in October, we started off going, okay, we need, to, we need to approach this technically, we need to look at how to try and de-risk this as best as possible before we drill. We're not doing anything fancy, we went and looked for structures, we went and did some magnetics. So we flew magnetics and we were looking to build a geological framework of the faults that are there. You're looking for big faults, things that can move fluids around on a large enough scale to form a big uranium deposit. So we did mag, and then we're looking for rock types. We're looking for a specific lithological contrast. So we did EM. Again, nothing particularly fancy. Basic EM, high resolution, modern technologies. Followed that up with a first pass drilling. We did eight drill holes, eight drill holes. And what did we see in that? We saw scale. We saw 30, 40 meters of thick alteration. Think back to Siobhan's alteration. Very, very similar rock patterns in here, guys. We saw Critically, evidence for uranium, four out of the eight drill holes had anomalous uranium, up to quarter of a percent in them. So I'm not saying this is an all grade hit, I'm saying this is proof that this plumbing system's working, the system's active, and you've got the scale opportunity with these rocks here. So we did eight holes, we got pathfinder elements, so that's the metals that float around with these deposits in five of those, and we got uranium in four of them, and we got the right rock types. When we were doing this, uranium was still bubbling along quietly, sitting at about 60 bucks per pound. So we said, right, what's the best way technically to advance this project, most cost-effectively for shareholder money? Um, and we looked at what some of our competitors had done. So there's a company called Baselayed Energy who sit uh, very close to, to the 92E project. They also recognize these same fault patterns. So the same two that we've tagged with uranium in. And what they see is that the scale of the alteration is big enough to be mapped in gravity. So we said, right, let's go do a gravity survey. We flew an airborne gravity survey, and that's where we are today. So picked out two big faults, both with scale, both with uranium in them. Flew airborne gravity, looking for big gravity lows, which will indicate that you've had the most fluid floating around, and selected a series of these gravity lows sitting correlating to that known structure. And that's what we're seeing in this map in front of you. This was only released a few days ago. Now that forms the basis for our next follow-up drill program. As I said, fully funded to go. We'll be rolling out a drill rig in late January, early February, and we'll be systematically testing the best, best um, targets that we have associated with these structures. What an opportunity, what a part of the world to be exploring, and you're looking at that potential reward of an arrow is, is a pretty exciting place for a $10 million market cap company. Okay, and that's just a bit of a close-up of that drilling area and the direct anomaly sitting adjacent to this. And again, Shimon mentioned scale. This is to scale on this map. These are the deposit sizes, and this is what we're looking for. So you see Arrow, 300 million pounds, 
and you see how that sits in these structures. They're only small, it's a big area. Taking this technical approach is by far the best way to try and do exploration in this part of the world. Okay, um, just briefly, we've still got a couple of minutes left. We also have what we call the traditional unconformity targets. So if you think back to my geology lesson a minute ago, in our North Millennium and Marshall projects. So this is surrounded by some of the bigger players of the area, Kanalaska, Cameco are uh, looking in the area. The North Millennium project, uh, creatively named because it's just to the north of the Millennium deposit. Now Millennium is about 100 million pounds at 4% uranium. To understand why we're excited, we have to understand a little bit about that deposit. So we have a fault, which Cameco called the mother fault, big north-south structure. Uh, sizable, regional, regionally sizable fault, like what I was describing at Geeky. Where it passes a specific rock type, we have a geophysical response, and the geophysical response is, disappears, and in that fault, we've got hosted 100 million pounds of uranium. Head to the north, uh, a couple of Ks, and we've had a little bit of drilling, and you've got those elevated pathfinder minerals, copper, cobalt, nickel, moly. Head into our project area, and you see the same disruption in the geophysics. So we're interpreting that to be the same rock time. So you've got a fault that you know it's carrying a lot of uranium, and you've got what we're interpreting to be a repeat of the same rock type, and you're only 7Ks from a major uranium deposit on the same structure. Pretty exciting proposition. A little bit deeper, 700 meter target depth, uh, but it's one that we will be doing some ground geophysics on in the next couple of months and setting up for a dual program uh, when the time is right and we've de-risked it to the best that we can. Add a little bit more weight to this. Our joint venture partner, it's just got chopped off this diagram, but in joint venture with Cameco next door, have just milled nine meters at 2.5% uh, uranium in that same geophysical structure. So again, adding to the, the, uh, the thesis that technically this really, really makes a compelling story. Um, we'll leave the Marshall project, but feel free to come and have a yarn to me about any of the technical credentials of these uh, and about the uranium space uh, and what we're up to. Briefly on the board, Blake Steele's our non-exec chair, so Blake was formerly the CEO of Ezaga. Uh, so during the last downturn, 2017, 18, 19, built up a series of US ISR projects. Um, so took them from a micro cap and ultimately did a sale into Encore Energy for 200 and something million dollars in early 2022. Very different skill set to mine, uh, very M&A focused, very corporate focused. My background, uranium geologist, worked in uranium for, for 18 years. Uh, some familiar companies, which I'm sure you'll be aware of, but has worked extensively in Australia and, and Southern Africa. And leading the technical charge is Odile Mofray. So Odile was formerly the project lead for Arano, uh, based out of Saskatchewan, so Arano being the big French uranium miner. Uh, she ran their projects for some 10 years specifically on this style of Athabasca mineralization. So a nice, rounded, technical and corporate team. But that's all for me for now, so feel free in one more minute. Well, where do you want me to go? <laughs> I was going off my timer. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. You did really, really well. Thank you so much, Peyton. Thank you for your graciousness to under fire from the technology. It seems to be getting into all of our, thing, our bits and pieces today. All right, now yesterday we knew them as Okapi resources, hence the small sign on the side of the booth. That's when I was looking for you guys. And it confused me a little bit. Today, we are introducing global uranium and enrichment, correct? All right, that's good. Thank you very much, Jackson. It's good here, isn't it? Thank you, Jackson. Can you give Jackson a clap, please, everyone? So very well, it's been, it's been very well trained. Uh, so it's a company, it's a new name, same company, but a new name, and it really sums up perfectly what you're doing. So Global Uranium and Enrichment is an emerging leader in developing uranium to support North America's transition to carbon-free nuclear energy. It's got several uranium projects. They're across US, they're across Canada, uh, and they're a cornerstone investor in Uberon. Now, that's an Australian company that's pioneering uranium, that's pioneering next generation enrichment technology. So the Tallahassee Uranium Project in Colorado boasts a significant resource estimate with room to, there's too much for me to say. Would you like to actually just take over here? All right. No problems. To, to find out more, would you please welcome Managing Director Andrew Ferrier, who has kept his name from yesterday. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, yeah, my name's Andrew Ferrier. I'm the Managing Director of a 
a company which was called Akapa Resources and it still officially is called Akapa Resources with the ticker OKR. Uh, we no longer thought Okapi was a, a good name to represent what our ambitions and intentions are, which is growing a uranium company in North America. Okapi is a endangered giraffe in the Congo, so not very relevant to us. So we're now in the process of, of you know, one or two days away from rebranding ourselves as Global Uranium and Enrichment. And we really like the name because it's exactly what we do. Uh, the new ticker will be GUE, but if you're buying shares as we speak, please still use the ticker OKR. So what's the opportunity to invest in, in global uranium? And I apologize if I can call ourselves a carpet during this presentation, but global uranium will go for the assets where across the US in Canada and we're also in the enrichment. So it makes us fundamentally unique to, to all other sort of uranium companies in the listed space. Um, but what you really need to know about uranium and the macro, I'm sure it's been spoken a lot about today, but we're in the early stages of the bull market. 2024 uh, is going to be crazy and it's going to show up in uranium equities. Uranium prices are US $80 a pound. If you look at the last bull run, it was six and a half years. The uranium price went up 1,000, 1,800%. So when uranium runs, it runs very hard. That's the main thing to understand. And what we're seeing now relative to the last bull run I would say there are more favourable characteristics for this uranium market to get a little bit more out of control. Uranium has been fundamentally uninvested in for the last 10 years since Fukushima. There has been no risk capital to invest in any exploration or development of effectively many uranium assets globally. We're in the US. Why do we want to be in the US? One, it's a good jurisdiction to work. Two, the US woke up two years ago to realize that, you know, 20% of its energy comes from nuclear and that nuclear energy is completely reliant on Russian and Kazakh uranium and rich uranium. That is not a good energy policy for the largest economy in the world. There are things in house committees as we speak talking about banning Russian uranium, in particular in rich uranium, which we can discuss more, but that's only going to go bell, bode well for companies with projects in countries like Canada and Australia, but in particular in the US, when we have one of the, the larger undeveloped uranium deposits in the US. Clean energy, I'm sure you've spoken about it. The world's woken up. You need clean baseload power. That's the key. Nuclear has to be a part of your mix, right? Your energy mix. You cannot rely exclusively on renewables. China knows it. India knows it. Europe's waking up to the fact the US is very aware of it when they have brownouts in the US as we speak already, and that's before every car in California becomes a Tesla. So what is global uranium? High quality ground in the US. We've got a bunch of very interesting exploration projects in the Athabasca. I'm glad Pete did such a good job explaining the basin to everyone. I will leverage off that in this presentation. And marine enrichment. And you get all that in a company which is currently valued at $25 million. This is what's happening to uranium price. I'm sure you've seen that uranium price graph a thousand times today. What you may have not seen is enrichment price graph on the right. So that's the SWU price. And why I like it so much is to show you how important geopolitically Russia's invasion of Ukraine was to the assets that we have. We've got assets in the US and the second we're investing in enrichment technology here in Australia. The, the, the world is changing very dramatically in terms of energy security. This graph on the left, I still really like. <laughs> it's been in my presentation now for 12 months and I can't, I don't want to get rid of it. Most people are unaware of how reliant the US is on, on foreign uranium, um, particularly out of Russia and Kazakhstan. Since 1980, the domestic production of uranium in the US has effectively dwindled to nothing. The US still has 93 reactors, 20% of all their energy, and they've become completely reliant on foreign uranium. That's about to change in the next six to 12 months. So what is global uranium? We'll go into the assets now, but we have 50 million pounds in the US. We're in the Athabasca and we have this enrichment play. All those summer parts are worth a lot more than our current market valuation. So moving to the projects. This is what we have in the US and Canada. We have three different projects in the US. Our main one is our Tallahassee uranium project, which is in Colorado. 
We have an existing draw compliant resource there of 50 million pounds uh, at a grade above 500 ppm, 540 ppm. The entire district surrounds 90 million pounds. Uh, we've got a fair chunk of that today. This year, 2023 has been a very busy uh, year for the team on the US. Uh, effectively, Tallahassee is on, on private land and private minerals, which is a big advantage. Uh, we've gone through a county process to get a permit. We're in a state process at the moment, which we're in the back end of, and that will allow us to get on the ground and do the work we want on Tallahassee. On the next slide, you can see how much, this is the Tallahassee project, how much drilling has been completed already on this project. We're the huge beneficiary of a lot of sunk capital over the years, particularly Cyprus in the 1970s, um, who got a full-blown mine permit to mine the Hanson deposit, um, which I don't really know how to work. The little the beamer here, but the Hanson deposit is effectively what you can see in the in the south there, where the very tight drillings occurred. So it's got 350,000 meters of drilling. It's a very well-known deposit. Hanson is sandstone uh, hosted deposit. The grades there are the best grades in the whole district. And what we'll do is fill a few holes in the technical data, which has been from the previous work done, and we'll look to put out a scoping study on Hanson in 2024. So that's all um, extremely exciting for us um, and a very keen focus for us. There aren't too many 50 million pound plus projects in the US, and in particular, this whole district as I said, was 90 million pounds. Moving on to our projects in the Athabasca, we have actually a very substantial position in the Athabasca. We have six projects close to 60,000 hectares. We acquired these projects close to 18 months, 24 months ago, uh, in terms of buying projects at the right price. Obviously, these projects would attract a very different price today than they did back then. Um, once we acquired these projects, we were very systematic in how we chose to prioritise the projects, um, worked very closely with um, consultants uh, in Saskatchewan and Newnham and Perch, which you can see up there in the, in the top right hand corner, uh, continued to show all the traits that we were focused on. Um, and as Pete mentioned, we were very focused in acquiring projects on the fringe of the Athabasca Basin. Um, and that's the reason for that we're looking for basement hosted deposits. Um, and the key advantage of that and being on the fringe of the basement of the sandstone is that our drill targets, particularly in Nunu and Perch, are within the first 50 to 150 metres. And the importance of that is drilling the Athabasca isn't cheap, right? So there's a big increased chance of probability if you can drill, you know, 10 holes at 150 metres rather than two holes at 750 metres, right? So there's that clear advantage for us. Uh, we've been very uh, systematic again on Noonan and Perch. We had uh, geos in the field 12 months ago, um, obviously mapping structures, doing a whole bunch of geochem. We then did airborne EM and gravity in April, May this year, um, and interpretation of those results, which isn't in this slide deck because it's a, such a short presentation time, uh, looks very fa favourable. It ticks all the boxes, um, and we're very keen to, to get out there and drill these deposits um, sort of ASAP. We do have a, a range of other projects uh, in the basin uh, and there are projects. So we have an exploration permit obviously at Noonan, so we're ready to, to drill. We also have one at, at Middle Lake as well, which you can see over there near the old Clough Lake mine. So that's the US, that's the Athabasca, the sort of the, the third leg to the, the global uranium story was earlier this year we invested into a company called Uberian. Uberian is an Australian company which is focused on advancing and developing a chemical enrichment technology here in Australia. Um, the, the company is based down at Ansto, which is in Lucas Heights in sort of southern Sydney, where the small nuclear uh, reactor in, in Australia is based. Um, the, com the information has been classified by the Australian government. They continue to progress that work uh, in the lab there. Um, and Uberian is quite quite unique and quite interesting for a few reasons. One, you know, there's not many opportunities to invest in the enrichment space. It's obviously a highly regulated part of the nuclear fuel cycle. 
and is largely controlled by three or four multinational companies who have been in the enrichment space for a long time. What's different about Uberian is it's a chemical enrichment company. That's separate to how uh, enrichment occurs globally, which is through centrifuges, which is basically spinning uranium-235 and 238 as fast as possible around. One of them is lighter, slightly lighter than the other. And if you do that process thousands and thousands of times on top of each other, then you then enrich uranium to the levels required to go into to nuclear reactors. The next sort of technology is Solex, which is what most people in, in this room, I'm sure, are aware of. Solex is a, is a well-known company with a chemical enriching technology. They have a laser technology, which is, again, very separate to centrifuges and very different to what Uberian has in chemical enrichment. Chemical enrichment isn't novel. It was investigated very heavily back in the 1970s by both the, the Japanese and the French, who spent hundreds of millions of dollars investigating chemical enrichment. At that point in time, centrifuges um, gained a lot of um, uh, sort of a leg up through improved efficiencies in the centrifuge process, largely through materials of construction advances, which allow those centrifuges to operate uh, more efficiently. But what you bear in doing is a, is a from what, what they've seen is a step better than what the Japanese and French were doing back then. So it's very exciting. It's sort of uh, uh, something we're very excited about very proud to be invested in the company we're a 22 percent shareholder um, i'm on the board of the company and it's obviously something that we we follow and, and pay close attention to and are pretty excited about what that company can achieve over the next six to 12 to 18 months um, we touched on it earlier but uh, russia has a fair chunk of the control of the enrichment capacity globally um, and that that wasn't an issue for a long time and now is an issue there needs to be a pretty dramatic expansion of western enrichment capacity around the globe um, and you've you could see that pretty directly if you just looked at a share price chart of of silex over the last 24 months so i think this is one of these technologies that isn't going to need to sort of force itself onto the market i think the market's going to come and grab it which is which is pretty handy um, and we'll continue to update our shareholders as you you bear and continues to advance moving forward the, the, the this slide is important just to highlight the uniqueness of Uberian. chemical enrichment has some fundamental unique characteristics which make it um, a simpler process it simplifies the nuclear fuel cycle and one of the reasons that is is pretty simple demonstration but centrifuges and and, and laser technology require a gaseous product, they UF6, so that is achieved by going through the conversion process. The conversion process in itself is a, a very constrained market at this time. Chemical enrichment, which is what Uberian is investigating, require, doesn't require the, the yellow cake, which is mined, to be turned into a gaseous process. So it just takes one whole step out of the nuclear fuel industry, which is particularly handy when you think about building our capacity moving forward. This is our corporate snapshot. Um, as I said before, um, very busy in the US. Obviously talked about our Tallahassee project, um, which will be advancing very quickly next year. We also have other projects in Colorado and in Utah, um, which we have permits to go drill on as we speak, particularly our projects in the LaSalle district, um, our Rattler projects. Um, all of that fits into a market cap of, of $25 million today so we see a huge amount of upside not just from the advancements and progression we're going to make on the assets but also from the macro backdrop and where where uranium is today or um, my background in mining private equity I spent a lot of time in the US I lived over there for seven eight years a matter of time okay don't worry about me that's fine this is the board we know what we're doing Jim and Tim are based in the US they've permitted mining operations, uranium mining operations in the US before. So we, we have the skill set to push assets forward in the US. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Andrew Ferry. Thanks, Matt. Now, one of the first people that I met when I got here today is our next speaker, and I think you're going to love him.
calls the spade a spade, if nothing else. Uh, he's very vocal about the political obstacles, especially within WA for uranium, and what it might take to change Australia's stance on nuclear power. He's a regular presenter and author of news articles uh, for nuclear energy in Australia and a number of other uh, institutions as well. As I said, he doesn't muck around. He's here today in his capacity as CEO of Cauldron Energy, Jono Fisher. West Australian born and bred and looking for uranium and critical minerals back here in his home state. Would you please make him welcome everyone? Yeah, thanks, thanks Chrissy, and great to be at RIU. First conference uh, I've done uh, with RIU and it's great to be in WA. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, I know the uh, presentation's been live streamed. Let's call out, I think. Uh, fairly supportive shareholders actually uh, on the live stream. Um, so thank you for that. They should be pretty happy today. We're up another 20%. Um, also, my kids are actually uh, watching. Um, and so kids, uh, you can watch this and go straight to bed. Um, so I'm going to tell you about why and look, it's inconvenient that the market's closed today. Make sure you remember first thing tomorrow. Put us on your watch list seat and have a look at what's going to happen. Um, meme on the right, bit of fun. I knew where I was on later in the day. We need to keep it a bit, a, bit, uh, a bit fun. How to solve climate change without nuclear energy, you cannot. And this meme I got off, um, off Reddit and the, and the crying man down there, um, you can kind of see that I've just put a little brown polygon. When I found it, that had solar and wind industry as the, as the crying dude. The other version I had had Chris Bowen as, as, as the crying man. I thought it would not be too political, um, so, so I removed it. But, you know, the UN tells the world, Chris Bowen doesn't seem to understand, but the UN tells the world, you will not reach net zero without nuclear. Um, and we've heard today, we'll continue hearing about how good the uranium industry is, so again, I'm going to skip most of that. Um, but we're certainly benefiting from that. And we have a few things going on, which means literally right now you guys should have a bit of a look at us and th th throw a bit uh, on the screen. Um, we're going to deliver a scoping study over the next few weeks. Um, that's for an ISR asset in WA. Um, if I was to put spot price and spot FX in that, now I'm not suggesting we will because it's going to look too positive. Um, it is it's going to look very good. There is a good uh, analogy to Boss Energy. So Boss is obviously capped at $1.5 billion. We capped at about 20. Um, they're both paleo channel deposits, uh, both about 80 metres underground, both ISR. So we are at about 40, depending on today's movement, about 40 cents uh, per pound of uranium. Boss is at about 20 bucks. Um, so think about the fact that this policy in WA will change. There is no doubt about it, and when it does, um, our upside is un un unbelievable. Um, so delivering a scoping study, we're actually drilling in about three weeks too. Um, that's for our Melrose asset, um, which is a nickel asset in the uh, West Hill gun. Um, we're going to actually drill out Yanri as well. We've got a, sh a lot um, of uh, uranium in WA, and we're about to we'll, we'll go and get some more. Um, and the other point to note, and that's why it's really interesting now, is you know, a recent capital raise is very successful. It's done at 0.9 cents. Today we closed at 1.7. Um, we got a new major shareholder on board, and that is a family office out of New South Wales who have made a lot of money in uranium. And they said they are extremely patient, um, and they, in their, their thesis is that the policy changes, and they're pretty, you know, they're, they're, they're stable, and actually they keep buying on market. Um, now, for a, for a small a sh a private shareholder, that should be really good. That, that should give you some comfort because obviously one of the things with juniors is liquidity can be a bit of an issue. Well, to know that there, there is an active major shareholder buying, um, I think is fantastic. And you see now volumes, um, whoops, which is the next slide, uh, have gone, the trading volumes have gone absolutely through the roof. So. Bit of information on this side. I'm going to call out Ian Mulholland. He's here somewhere, but these lights, I can't actually see him. Um, you know, John Borshoff got a, a bit of an Empress welcome uh, in, in terms of his track record in the industry. Well, I'd say the most respected geo in the room has got to be Ian. Um, a long history of exploration and discovery. Um, his Padawan is Angelo Socchio, who is a, a Brazilian geologist. So hopefully, he'll be at the conference tomorrow. He's just a little bit busy 
um, planning our drill campaigns, but he'll be down here too. Now, those guys technically mean we can review, we can do a lot of good technical, but we also review a lot of you know, new projects from a technical perspective. Um, and so one of the things we will be doing, um, we're gonna buy another asset in due course. Um, we, we're thorough, we're not gonna buy just the first thing that uh, comes across the desk, but we are looking for more uranium. Um, you can see the increase in volume. You can see the increase in share price. Um, look, that share, share price increase might look a bit steep, but what I'll say is, is we're only, only starting to get back, we're not there yet, to where we should be. The company has a history. Um, we've been out in the wilderness for about five years, and we did a recap about a year ago. Um, so the, the, the companies, if this share price went back share price chart went back a few more years you'd see the the price at 30 cents and it's and it's trended down and it was it was it did that for two reasons one is the wa uranium ban not good um and the second is it was just insanely poorly done from a shareholder engagement perspective um now we're addressing that and um anyone who, who follows the company will see how active i am on on, on twitter and, and linkedin and in, in webinars getting the story out there uh, and the second thing is that the uh, momentum in the uranium price um, going through the roof. Okay, so core products, um, two on the left. We do have some WA silica sand assets that we will get rid of in due course, and we've sold uh, a historic uh, asset. Now, I know everyone has said this, so nuclear demand is going up, right? There is not enough uranium even cover today's demand and today at cop 28 the us the uk and a few other companies are saying they are going to triple the nuclear capacity and it doesn't quite work that triple nuclear capacity mean doesn't actually mean quite triple uranium but let's just assume it does so today's mines can only cover about 75 percent of the market the rest is physical and and secondary sources that are drying up triple the nuclear capacity and where the hell is the uranium going to come from some of it will come from CAS. Some will come from the Athabasca, although the Athabasca has got price issues because it's so deep. Um, and some of it's going to come from Australia and it bloody well should. We've got more uranium in this country than anywhere else. Um, we, we are the, WA is the world's best mining jurisdiction and it should be the world's best uranium mining jurisdiction. What we suffer from here is a little bit of history driven by the left of the Labor Party, um, yet it is, it is a history that is kind of out of date. And actually the, the turnout in the room today around interest in uranium, it just highlights um, how unpopular the current uranium mining policy is and um, what an opportunity there is for investors. Um, you, you guys can understand it for when this stuff changes. So there are a few things we need to change and I'll actually just comment on the good doctor's presentation. I think it's really good that he was here and highlighting some interest, interesting challenges for the industry. And, and a lot of those challenges he was highlighting was re with respect, obviously, to mineral sands, because simply that's where the activity is today. But many of that things would apply to uranium as well. And I think it's great that he's here doing that because it shows that, you know, if there was absolutely no possibility for us getting this banned, he wouldn't be here. You know, th that kind of stuff get on the uh, on the radar. Um, the second thing is, last week we had the Global Uranium Conference um, and the good doctor said WA's uh, RAD regulations are the best in, the best in the world. Well, we had a presentation from the South Australian government, the South Australian uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, who have a history of allowing successful uranium mining in their state. Their changes to the regs over there they say the world's best practice and my god they were practical right they were supporting an industry that delivers money into their state coffers um, and they were in an industry which has extremely high worker satisfaction um, i th i think i think that there's a change coming and i think the um the regulatory environment in the country in the, and in, in the state can move to a to a more even keel I, I'm not going to go over this. Obviously, pricing, except my chart is bloody out of date because that says 72. It's now now 82. I, <laughs> I have to change it every week. Um, so, state of play in WA. 
the Libs support uranium mining, right? Number one. Number two, it is a policy, not legislation, that stops it in the state. Now, what does that mean? It means that when the, when the government changes, they don't have to introduce new legislation. It is literally the pen of the mining minister makes a few notes on a page and that's done. Um, it will be very quick when that happens. So it either happens at the next election, um, the odds are improving on that, um, or maybe the one after. Um, or the other thing that can happen is that the Labor Party reads the room and sees how popular or how unpopular the policy is. And so there's a lot of, a lot of engagement going on um, at the moment. We've got um, polling out, which is on the next page. There, is, there are debates happening federally for nuclear and, 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 and they, they, they apply to the state as well. And this is the stuff that would not have happened five years ago, driven by a fundamental desire by the, the population to, to get to net zero, to address climate change, and people just common sense saying, why the hell would we try and do this with, with a one arm tied behind our back? So what do the polls actually say? Well, the polls say, and it's this middle one here, the polls say uh, that the uranium mining is, is ban is very unpopular. Now, this is from the Minerals Council. We did this um, polling a few months ago. Everyone would expect that the majority of Liberal voters support uranium mining and oppose the ban, right? That, that wasn't surprising. Um, majority of Labor voters, support uranium mining. 34% um, of Greens voters support uranium mining. 80% of One Nation voters support uranium mining too. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you're already at a point where the majority of the population, and this is, this is, shouldn't surprise anyone, we're a mining state. The majority of the population want uranium mining in the country, in the state. The majority of Australians want nuclear energy to be considered as part of, an, of the future energy mix. So we're not saying, let's go nuclear, let's go build 20 reactors. What we're saying is, why do we have a ban on, on nuclear energy in the country? It, it doesn't make sense. Remove the ban, let any proposed plant go through the enormous amounts of, of red tape and bureaucracy that it will do, as you have to do when building any major project in this country. Um, let's see what the market can deliver, because um, globally, um, the rest of the world's delivering nuclear, and when nuclear comes online, price, power prices tend to drop. Um, and it's something where it, it, I, I saw a tweet the other day um, where people are suggesting that actually Chris Bowen is becoming a bit of a liability um, to Anthony Albanese with respect to his energy policy. They've, they've, they've swung so far to the left. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that, that plays out because there's certainly a, a groundswell of support for, for nuclear um, and uranium. Now, what, what would a uranium mining industry do for WA? Well, I can think of very few policies that would create so many new jobs, um, really well-paying jobs from construction operations, but also lab, labs, RDs at, at university, a um, huge amount of jobs, 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 and then multiply, that economic multiplier for the community. Um, the state gets new royalties, income taxes, payroll taxes, and diversification of revenues. Okay. Um, and the other thing is when you consider scope three emissions, we could help the world decarbonize, right? We, we, we survive on iron ore and oil and gas at the moment. Um, the scope three profile of those are horrendous. Um, Australia, WA especially, um, can actually, um, if you consider scope three on uranium, we can become a net carbon sink and we can improve the outcomes for the world. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about the rest of our um, fantastic projects, but I'm here for the next two days, so, so come, and, come and have a chat. Um, my final point is here, um, where we have a POW approved to drill out Yanri. Um, we'll be doing that when it gets a bit cooler. That'll be on the back of a new scoping study, which will show a fantastic outcome uh, for an ISR project. Uh, the, um, you know, the exploration target on top of that makes it an even bigger asset. Um, there's a lot of uranium there. Um, it's, a, it's truly a world-class asset. So I'll, at, at that, I'll, I'll leave that, Chrissy. So thank, thank you all, um, and please come and, come and have a chat. You sure there?
I'm prepared to give you 20 seconds of extra power. You see, you've got, you've got, you're good now. You got, did you say goodbye to the children? That was the more important thing. Quick, they might still really. What are the kids? <laughs> what are their kids' names? Uh, Emily, it... Willow, and Tommy. Three, just the three. King Thomas. King Thomas. And you fix that? Just stopping at three. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, look, there was a real spring in the step of our next presenter this morning when I saw him. Um, first words to me, and he it was accompanied by a huge grin, nothing to do with me, because the first words that came out of this fellow's mouth were, it's you time. It's you time. Just like his beloved Carlton, it's you time. It's time for a resurgence of both Carlton and uranium. And the two topics that our next presenter is very, very passionate about. He had a definite date for me when the pinnacle of Carlton would be in 2024, and that is the 28th of September. He wasn't exactly sure on the day and the month of when uh, his beloved Valor would be the, the explorer on the lips of everyone here in Western Australia, but it's definitely 2024 and he wants to take you on that ride. So would you please welcome our next presenter, the Executive Chairman you are now, aren't you? Valor Resources Executive Chairman, George Bork. Please make him welcome everyone. Thank you, Christy, and uh, thank you also to the organisers of Vertical Events, Stewie and, and Jackson, who do a fantastic job. And I think Jackson singled me out about being uh, in the early days of the Uranium conferences when there used to be protesters out the front of uh, the Esplanade in Fremantle. How far we've gone. You got it? Okay. All right. So if I just take you through uh, the value, the Valor investment proposition, um, there's been some fantastic presentations today. And I think the first one by David Franklin from Argonaut really highlighted a number of key things. When they talk about what they look for in an investment um, uh, target. Uh, they look at the jurisdiction, the commodities, um, they look for third party validation when it comes to um, other companies that look at their projects to, um, to see what the value is. And there's a number of these factors that um, we can talk about within the Valor portfolio. Um, we've also got a track record of, of uh, discovery and our technical director, Robin Wilson, who's on a plane at the moment uh, going to Peru. Um, Robin was the person that uh, discovered the Browns Range uh, heavy rare earth deposit up in the northern part of Western Australia. So he has a great claim to fame of um, being the leader of discovering that project. Um, and that was, uh, I always say that was uh, right place, wrong time. Um, I think um, hopefully we're now in uranium exploration, we're getting to the right time to find these discoveries. In terms of Valor, I've been here for three years. And when I first joined Valor Resources, we were actually a, uranium, a, a copper, uh, you guys after the presentation? I've got a copy here. Yep. So we started off as a chasing copper in Peru. And um, when I came along, we, uh, we had a bunch of uranium assets in the Athabasca Basin that were brought into Valor Resources. As we're working through the uranium assets uh, in the Athabasca, Athabasca Basin, we also were advancing our, our copper project in Peru. And so for the last few years, we took that from literally no work all the way through to a driller. A drilling company is on site at the moment. I'll take you through that in a little while. So that's been a fantastic advancement by the company um, to this point. Our focus now goes back to uranium in Canada. Um, and we have been working there for a number of years. Um, with market sentiment away from uranium, it has been difficult to raise money to explore. And as you've heard today with a number of presentations, when you are going through $80 a pound, we're starting to see that sentiment come into the uranium sector. So hopefully the people that are making a bucket load of money out of lithium can uh, sprinkle some of that across to uh, the uranium explorers. Um, we've got uh, a portfolio. Here we go. Uh, that's the disclaimer and forward-looking statement that I should have mentioned at the outset. Um, so 
we, we divested our portfolio out of Peru um, to a company called Firetail and also Barrick. Um, and again, as I said, when, uh, when you look at the presentation from Argo, um, when you have someone like Barrick who acknowledges the project you have and doesn't earn in, that shows um, some credibility to the company and the exploration team. We've got five key projects in the Athabasca Basin um, and a number of them are drill ready. Um, again, they're in such a great jurisdiction. Um, having worked in a lot of parts of the world and when you start comparing the pluses and minuses of um, various jurisdictions, it's fair to say there's a good reason why Saskatchewan and Canada um, rank very highly in the uh, Fraser Institute um, of uh, jurisdictions in the world to do mining and, and mining investment. Um, you have a fantastic place where you can get drill permits very quickly. Once you apply for a, an exploration tenement, you get it very quickly. So things happen really quickly uh, in Canada. What's the, the negatives? Well, uh, it's, it's remote, higher cost to do business, but the price is high. And I think um, the presentation from Peter really summed it up very well, that uh, when you're looking to invest in a company, you want to see what the potential upside is. And in the Athabasca Basin, it's huge upside. The, the prize is enormous, but they're challenging prizes when they're such high grade. So I'll take you through the five projects we have there from Hidden Bay through to Beatty Creek. In terms of corporate snapshot, uh, market cap of uh, $13.6 million. Um, we have hopefully a number of shares on issue as is the size of the project we're looking for in pounds. Um, and in terms of board of directors, um, myself, Gary Billingsley is actually a very experienced geologist who actually lives in Saskatchewan. Um, so it's fantastic to have someone that's worked on the ground uh, in the uh, area that uh, we currently have our assets. And as mentioned at the outset, Robin Wilson was instrumental in discovering the Browns Range heavy rare earth deposit in Western Australia. So what are the ingredients of success? We're focused on high grade uranium in Canada. Again, you would have seen some presentations in this session that talks about the extremely high grades of uranium uh, deposits within Canada. Um, you've got a number of areas within the Athabasca Basin. It's fair to say that where you can see Surprise Creek in the, uh, in the northwest corner, that's where uranium production first commenced in, in Saskatchewan. Then you started to see Clough Lake come on, which was down the southeast part um, of, um, uh, of the Athabasca Basin. Um, and you had Clough Lake being drilled, uh, being mined by a reaver. Um, the average grade of that deposit was 0.92% or 9,200 ppm. And then we started to see the great discoveries on the eastern flank where a lot of people have moved across to, where we've seen MacArthur River Lake, where you've got plus 10% deposits. So you've seen a shift from the, the, the northwest down the south and now across. Um, we've got projects that cover all of those areas um, for particular reasons and for targets um, that I'll explain. Um, the experienced team, I'll add that um, we're well supported by a group called Terra Resources, who's owned by Barry Bourne. They have about 13 geophysicists. And the great thing is, is that the person we use most is a guy by the name of Rob Black, who actually migrated to Australia from Canada when Cameco came to um, Australia. And so it's fantastic to have a geophysicist that spent his life um, on interpreting and working for Cameco in the basin. And he has done a lot of the interpretation of our geophysics. And then we've also got a significant free carried upside in Peru. I don't think I've got to go through uranium. Everyone's heard um, the stories. Um, this is a nice little um, uh, different way to present it. Not every uh, EV is the same. Uh, an electric vehicle driven in a country dominated by nuclear power has a better footprint than a, a car, that, a Tesla that's been driven in a, company, in a country uh, that produces a dominance of coal. So it's important to understand what the source of the electricity is that charges your electric vehicle. So why the Athabasca Basin? Um, there's, a, there's a number of interesting statistics and you've seen some presentations today that talk about um, the, the, there seems to be a bit of infancy and lack of discovery over um, the last period of time in the Athabasca Basin. The Athabasca Basin has the highest amount of um, Ukraine residents outside of Ukraine. It was actually a socialist state that when you go back through the history, you saw the privatisation of the uranium assets many years ago. And that changed with the formation of Cameco. 
Um, when you go back in the last 30, 40 years, a lot of Canadians left Saskatchewan from an exploration perspective because they weren't sure about the political environment and whether they were going to be able to own their asset. That's now changed and changed dramatically to the point where it's now a number one area uh, of political stability and a great place to do mine exploration. Um, the other point there is um, there's now the approach of doing a lot of modern exploration like airborne geophysics. Uh, to back that up, in Canada, you get a 50% bonus on your expenditure using airborne survey if you provide the data to the Saskatchewan government um, towards your exploration expenditure commitments. So they're really encouraging um, the use of modern technology. So I'll quickly run through these. Um, so this is our number one project. And again, through the guidance of Barry Bourne, we use a very detailed process to rank our projects based on geological factors, proximities, potential, and so forth. So Hidden Bay has come up with our number one target uh, of projects in the Athabasca Basin. We've got an unconformity that runs through the project. We've got Rabbit Lake, which is located about 20 kilometres to the north. Um, it's undercover, so we've had to use airborne gravity. So we flew that um, about 15 months ago. It's been processed by the guys uh, in Fremantle, as mentioned. We've used radon to try to get some form of uh, geochem, um, which can be useful. And we've now identified a project um, which has five holes for up to 2,360 metres. We're fully permitted. Um, we hope to be drilling this in 2024. Uh, and as mentioned before, we will be targeting these gravity lows. So these have all been designed and ready to drill. Clough Lake, um, again, this is on the south, uh, oh, sorry, on the southwest side of the Athabasca Basin. Again, when you look at neurology, within seven kilometres of our boundary, you've got the Clough Lake project, which delivered about 60 million pounds at 9,200 ppm. And there's structures that support that um, we've got favourable mineralisation that should be coming onto our property. You've also got the Shea Creek project, which is about 100 million pounds, running at about 1.3%. It's probably one of the best projects in the Athabasca Basin that has been undeveloped. However, that deposit starts at about 700 metres. Um, so I'll just quickly highlight that with the interpretation of our gravity work, um, it's been identified that our targets sit between 50 and 150 metres of surface. So again, I think as Andrew highlighted with his analogy, it's probably better to drill uh, 10 200 metre holes than two 750 metre holes. Um, so that's the advantage we've got there. Again, we've got drill permits in place um, that's all been designed, ready to go, and we hope to be doing there in 2024. Surprise Creek is in the southwest. That's a new area people are going to. Um, this one's different to the other two projects. The other two projects are driven by geophysics. This has got a lot of geochem, a lot of rock chips and soils on surface. Um, there was historical drilling, so back in 1968, 55 years ago, there was a hit of 2.1 metres at 4.3%, um, which needs follow-up. However, you can get caught up in these high grades, great rock chips, let's go, but we need to do a lot more reconnaissance work, mapping, we actually need to fly airborne over this project area and then develop a program to target this. This is ranked number three in our portfolio. Whilst it's got great grades on surface, we need to make sure that we're comfortable that it's got a sufficient size to put a program there. On the left-hand side of this project area, there's quite spectacular copper grades. Um, Philip Stodge did a lot of work um, a number of years ago and walked away from the project and um, you can see uh, 6.6 .6 metres of 1.31% copper plus a number of other hits of copper. So we're seeing a lot of exciting areas. We've just done a deal to expand the package, which goes to the um, the northwest of that property. Um, so we see this as an exciting project. A um, couple of minutes. So uh, Hook Lake, we've drilled that. Um, we had some interesting mineralisation to start with, but nothing earth shattering. And this is ground right near um, base load and also the guys... Um, at Bucks and Energy. Beatty River, heavy rare earths, um, being my background with Northern Minerals and Gary Billingsley on the board actually used to own this project. This has got some pretty stunning grades of heavy rare earths with particular reference to dysprosium and terbium, 1.15% dysprosium. Um, you're lucky to get eight, 900 ppm at times of dysprosium alone. So this is to the southwest of Clough Lake and we'll look to get on the ground and do some um, early stage reconnaissance work. And just quickly, copper in Peru, 
Um, we actually completed a deal with Firetail, um, $200,000 exclusivity, $550,000 cash paid on completion, which we received. We have 15 million shares worth about $1.5 million at the moment, a further 20 million through performance rights and hurdles. So we'll own 20% free carrier this project plus 20% undiluted uh, a diluted um, uh, position in Firetail. Um, Chirake, we pegged that, cost us about $40,000. Um, Barrett gave us $200,000 beginning um, to take a, take that project, and they're working on that now. Um, we'll, we'll earn up to a million US dollars of payments over the next number of years as they advance that project. So we've been able to recover um, value for our shareholders. We've stopped the dilution because um, Firetail are doing the work. They are drilling this project. So every bit of work that's been done in Peru was done by the team at Valor Resources. Most of them migrated across to Firetail. Um, drilling is underway at the moment. It's currently on the Fudician target, which is the big red blob of IP resistivity. And they're about 150 metres down that hole. Um, I wish I could uh, build camps in Western Australia at the price of the picture camp because that camp's at 4,200 metres brand spanking new and cost us 60,000 US dollars to build. So um, uh, cost effective in Peru. And it's a very, um, I think it's a great country to work in, um, in terms of the support of the government. However, it took us 20 months to get the uh, drilling permit. So that was the big negative of working in Peru. So in summary, um, we've, um, might, we've pivoted back to uranium. Um, we got lost in Peru, but I think we've created value for our shareholders. and. If Firetail hit the jackpot there, I think we're going to have great upside in there, both in the share price, up to 35 million shares free carried in that project. It's in um, elephant country, but now we're into, you know, we're in uranium. We've been there for three years. We just haven't shifted there because it's the sexy thing of the day. We, we started there in uh, October 2020. The Athabasca Basin is one of the greatest grades in the world, so there's a great advantage to be there. You can get your permits quickly, and I'll hand over to Christy. Thank you. Yeah, George, thank you so much. I'm sorry about the technological uh, challenges there, but you, you did well, showed your metal. All right, our next presenter has many years in the resources sector and is about, on the odd occasion, he travels out of the uranium sector, but somehow he always finds himself winding back in. And this time, the draw card was a project in Senegal in West Africa. And Senegal is seen by the World Bank as a good place to be investing in. Um, they see it as one of the most positive places in West Africa. So the project itself, the company, actually, we are having this discussion a bit. And read your pro if you read your program in front of you, and have a look at the, the name that's in front of you. John Davis, how do you say the name? Haranga. Haranga, okay. And how would you say the name, sir? Look at this one, Haranga or Haranga? Uh, Haranga. Haranga, haranga. So it's a bit of a potato, potato, tomato, tomato. But it's, you, you now you sit there and you think about it and you remember the name of this company. What we want you to remember is what the secret source for the project is. So think scale, think grade. Peter Batten is their MD. So let's hear what he has to say about it. And I'll give you the ability even to change the pictures. There you go. Yeah, make it nice and easy. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to introduce Haranga the correct way to pronounce it. Sorry? Pull them down. You know what, let's wait for one second. Ladies and gentlemen, can you put your hands together, please, for Peter Batten? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you for the opportunity to introduce Saranga. Um, I haven't presented at a conference for over 10 years, so excuse my nervousness. Uh, it's a bit daunting. That you can read at your leisure. Uh, so I have only just joined Haranga, I joined in September, and I was attracted to the company because of the assets that they have and the team that they have uh, and the opportunity that is, that is there also by the fact that the timing is absolutely correct for uranium. Uh, got a lot in common with George's talk. Uh, I was uh, impressed with Dave Franklin's comments and at the end he, he came up with a list of eight items that investors should look for uh, going into this dangerous world. Uh, like talking to my wife after four, I didn't hear anything more. So, but if you look at Haranga, uh, we have the first four down pat, uh, the mining province. Senegal's a very stable country, they're pro-mining. 
uh, predominantly phosphate and gold mines, but um, they like us. In fact, the, the village mayor has asked us to please find a mine because they'd like the economy. Um, we have a significant scale asset. Um, we have a, a resource of 16.1 million pounds inferred uh, that we put out in September. Um, and whilst it, it's not huge, it is uh, open in all directions and can be expanded. And someone earlier today said that they had a 5.1 million pound resource and that was a good start. I just argue that 16.1, maybe that's a better start. Uh, it's a mainstream commodity, uranium is here. Um, all the fundamentals say that it's going to be sustainable. Uh, I say that every time I think there's a bull market in uranium and hopefully I'm right this time. And then the fourth component was competent management. And with the team that we've got, we've got a, a team housed in Senegal that's been there for 23 years um, and they've been operating within the system and uh, they're very, very knowledgeable in that area. Uh, we've just started on the uh, World Economic Forum matrix um, and we're going forward with this and we'll progress that and publish our results as we go. This is a, uh, a snapshot at the company. Um, we've got a market cap of, of under $13 million and 75 million shares on issue. The other uh, similarity we have with, with uh, George Bork is that Jason Peterson's also a major investor in this company, but he's 8% in our company, so maybe he likes it better than George's. Uh, the people, um, the team, Mike Davies, uh, been in the industry a long time myself. I've got 40 years as a mining, or as a geologist and a mining geologist, and uh, I've been in uranium since 2006. John Davis is a very experienced geologist. Hendrik Schloman is another geologist in um, uh, Johannesburg, who's also worked in Senegal, and Jean Casson's the key guy there, the Chief Operating Officer, who's in um, Senegal and has been for 23 years. I won't go through this. Everybody's been through it. People have done it better. There are certainly better slides there. So we get to Senegal, and why Senegal? People don't know Senegal. I was recently at the Australia Down Under conference, and I spoke to hundreds of people at the conference. I found two people who were familiar with Senegal. So Senegal is in West Africa. It's considered by the World Bank the safest uh, country in West Africa. It's about to enter its fourth peaceful transition of, of government since independence in 1960. It's a population of 17 million people. Dakar, the capital, is a, is a major modern city with good infrastructure, good health, health care. Uh, infrastructure extends outside the capital, unlike several other, other West African countries. Uh, we're 880 kilometres away from Dakar, and that's sealed road all the way. Uh, power is, state power is available everywhere you are in, in Senegal. Um, it's a, a pro-mining jurisdiction. Um, they have phosphate mines in the north and they have gold mines in the southeast. Uh, within the area, there's uh, 40, million 40 million ounces of gold mining in the southeast. Um, and it's a modern mining law. It was, uh, the new mining law came out 2016 and the regulations came out 2017. Uh, we talk about jurisdictions and mining jurisdictions. I was there, I left Senegal uh, September 22, having sat down with my team up there and devised the next stages of our operation. Um, we agreed that we would start auger drilling of our termite mound anomalies to determine the orientation, the mineralisation responsible for it. Uh, we agreed to do that on September the 20th. Uh, we started drilling last week, unlike George's 20 months to get his drilling permissions. So the Soraya project is the main asset that we have at the moment. Now, Soraya was explored in the 60s by Kojima uh, in the, the 20, from 20, 2006, 2011 by Arriva, uh, virtually the same company. We inherited that information from them and that um, has allowed us to get to a mineral resource. Um, we inherited about 80,000 metres of drilling 
uh, 68,000 metres of that is at Soraya. So we put that together, the team before I joined them, put that together into a three-dimensional model and came up with the resource, um, and uh, which is 16 million pounds, with a grade of 587 ppm. This is a, the mineralisation is in epicyanite, which is hard rock. Hard rock's a little bit more expensive than ISR, ISL, or um, the carnotite mining that's been discussed today. This is the resource, this is Soraya, the model. Uh, you can see the, the blue empty wire frame that shows that the, um, the information is data bound and that we can expand the resource by drilling those extensions. Uh, the majority of the drilling was completed by Kojima. Uh, Haranga drilled 22 holes to confirm the data. Nearly all of Kojima's drilling was above 160 metres vertical. Arriva's drilling went down to 240 metres vertical, but that's not as much drilling as, as Kojima. The majority of the, the drilling is by Kojima. So that 16 million pounds can be expanded on, and um, the grade as has been pointed out again today, is the grade is, is an important factor in all of these resources. Um, Soraya is one of seven anomalies we have in a corridor of, of anomalism that's 25 kilometres long. The process that we explore, we use to explore for uranium over there is the initial um, sampling of termite mounds. Now, in our area of Senegal, we have a laterite cap that can extend uh, for a number of metres, and it masks all radiometric signatures. Soraya was selected by Kojima to explore because the laterite cap is missing in that area, and toids and the epicyanite, which is the host of the mineralisation, were exposed, and were exposed to radiometric surveys. That's how they located that. Um, you can't do that everywhere. And so what we've resorted to is, a, is a, a very common method in this part of Africa and elsewhere in the world, and that's termite sampling. So first we do wide space termite sampling. We, we set, sample the termite mound, sieve it down to a relative space that gives us saprolite material, and then we process that. So we do it on a wide space where we find the mineralisation we close the space in. That's what uh, Soraya Northeast and Sonella down the bottom, that's the dense red. They're the closed in spaces. They're the most advanced of the six other anomalies that we have outside of Soraya. So presently we are auger drilling those anomalies and that's to determine if, or not determine the orientation of the mineralization that's sitting underneath and is the host of the anomalism. Once we have orientation, uh, the one, we will select one of those two anomalies to be the next anomaly that we drill. And we've booked an RC drill rig for uh, December, middle of December, which is the dry season, the only time we can drill. So these are those two anomalies, and you can see the augering that's about to happen. That's an auger in the bottom. Um, we've got a fully funded 20,000 metre auger program, and that will test those and give us the best indications for the next way forward. The RC drilling, the intention of the RC drilling is to locate the next Soraya. We think that we have the potential within that 25 kilometre mineralised corridor, we have the potential for numerous other Sarayas. And Soraya is at 16 million pounds now, but can be expanded further drilling. The resource is 100% um, inferred. We're actually getting a metallurgical sample over to Canada at the moment. And with the results, positive results from that um, test work, we'll be able to upgrade that resource to indicated and inferred. Apart from uh, our uranium projects, uh, we also have the Ibel South Gold project. Um, within that area, you can see in the right hand um, diagram, there's a numerous uh, gold mines in the Brimian um, Greenstone Belt. There's 40 million ounces in that area. Uh, we've just completed termite sampling at Ibel South, and we have a number of strong anomalies there. Um, we haven't planned for the next stage of, of exploration there, but uh, we, it, that will occur sometime shortly after um, 
we'd start the expert RC drilling at um, Soraya, at well, Ibel South or Sonella. Uh, this is the program for when we're going forward. And I guess it's our, our news flow at the same time. We put out the initial MRE in September. Uh, we've been trying to get the samples to Canada. Um, it's been a little bit delayed, but that metallurgical work will start hopefully in December with the results in December or, or in January. Um, we'll then go to the RC drilling. We have recommenced termite sampling at Mandon Coley and, and the other three anomalies. So we'll be producing the results of the, the termite mounds and hopefully be coming up with other anomalies or intense anomalies and targets for RC drilling as we go forward. The RC dr drilling, uh, we budgeted for three to 6,000 metres, reasonably significant. Um, and then as we go forward, we expect that uh, some of the results will allow us to start on the next work uh, as we go for a, an MRE upgrade. And then we've got extension drilling and hopefully with success some drill targets, um, definition and resource drilling from that. So that's basically the program for Soraya. Soraya has uh, been, and Haranga has been quiet, but we do have a significant um, uranium deposit and we have the potential for multiples of that. And it's that potential which is attractive with the company. So Senegal, we're a safe mining province. Uh, we do have a starter resource that can expand on its own, but it's also one of a multiple or potential multiples. Um, we intend to start RC drilling in December. We are orbit drilling now and um, we're feeding, we, we hope to be feeding all of these resources and expanded resources, significant level of resources into the uranium market as it sits. And that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> I reckon Peter Batten, you did pretty well for a bloke who hasn't done that for 10 years. Would you give him a warm round of applause, please? That was really good. We were joking before about clipboards and bits of chalk, but I reckon you did absolutely brilliantly. Now, if you were around back in 2017 and you listened to our next presenter when the uranium price was around $18 US a pound, and he said the spot price would have to pass $80 US a pound for them to bring on any new production. I wonder if you would have admired him or you would have laughed at him like a number of people did back in the day. Um, I think it was pretty optimistic that that spot price would manage to reach that figure. Brandon Munro is the individual who made that claim. He's a CEO of Bannerman Energy. He's been with Bannerman for the long run. Um, he believes in their prospects. He believes in the numbers they've run. And it's, it is the most advanced Greenfields Uranium project. And as we all know, sometimes you need to be prepared to play that long game with your investments, don't you? So. As we have a look at him today, and I look at him, he's got a big smile on his face, and I'm saying to myself, in that presentation there, have you put a slide that covers off on the fact that the spot price has broken through the magical figure? Are you prepared to make an announcement regarding new production? Would you please make him welcome, everyone? Thanks, Chrissy, and you're absolutely right. It's a good time to be alive if you're a uranium CEO today. It's an even better time to be alive if you're a uranium investor. And tomorrow will be the second best time to be alive if you're a uranium investor. So let's talk about Bannerman Energy. So I'd like to give you the speed reading test. It's not too late in the afternoon to get your way through those important messages. They're on our website. You can find them there. Bannerman Energy. We are the leading next generation uranium player, absolutely poised to deliver into the spectacular uranium market that we're seeing unfolding before our eyes at the moment. So our Atango project in Namibia, it's one of the world's largest undeveloped projects. It's also the most advanced Greenfields project that's ready for development at the moment. We're perfectly positioned in Namibia. I'll enjoy talking to you about that in a moment. We've strongly de-risked it over 18 years of technical work um, to be in this position we're in, and that ideally positions us for enjoying now the fruits of a long period of patience. 
So as I say, it's one of the world's largest and most advanced uranium development projects. Now, what, what basis do I have for saying that? Well, first of all, we've got a resource of 220 million pounds. Only 60 million pounds of that is in our initial 15 year mine life based on the definitive feasibility study that we released last December. So that tells you that there's a lot of scope for growth and that growth could come from either a mine expansion, by production expansion, an extension of the mine life, or most likely both of those things. In addition to that 225 million pounds, we have substantial satellite deposits that are within trucking distance that will see this initial 15 year mine life in my view, develop into a multi-decade mine. So the Rossing uranium mine down the road from us started in 1976 on a 16-year mine life, recently celebrated its 45th operating year continuously, and it's got a mine life extension for at least another 10 years. We've got so much material under the known resource at the moment. We know that the deposit extends at depth. We think that a tango will be something like that. Namibia really is the ideal place to develop a greenfields uranium project. So what makes it special? First of all, it's been ex uh, exporting uranium for 45 years. The development capitals associated with bringing a new uranium jurisdiction into the uranium exporting world are very, very substantial. Small junior, you do not want to be coming up against that risk profile. So in Namibia, we've enjoyed all of the regulatory support, all of the public knowledge, all of the things that go with successful, continuous exporting of uranium for more than four decades. There's already three large scale mines, one's about to come back into production in the form of Langer Heinrich. That means that despite the fact that Namibia is a tiny population, We've got an ample workforce well trained of local Namibians that we can draw from when we're ready to start employing for our mine. Uh, it's a very clear mining code. It's got a good rule of law. The government regularly loses court cases, which is a good litmus test in Africa. And it's just a, a pleasure to be there. The community is highly supportive and I feel qualified to make that statement because I lived there with my wife Angela for more than five years. So we were embedded in the community. We understand how they tick. And in absolute stark contrast to the challenges we've been talking about in Western Australia today, they support it, they want it. They're all looking forward to another uranium mine coming on because they've had 45 years of nothing but good things coming from uranium mining in the Swakopmund area of Namibia and the broader country. So over the last 18 years, this slide sets out the vast array of detailed, quality, fastidious technical work that we've done to position this project as bulletproof going into the development cycle that we're ready to start shortly. So it includes all of the usual stuff. We've done a definitive feasibility study twice, once for a massive development at seven million pounds, more recently for a smaller development that gets into production with lower development hurdles. That's three and a half million pounds. But we've gone further than that. We've also uh, built and operated a pilot plant for more than five years and put our heat bleach sulfuric acid processing route through exhaustive test work so that we can truly say that heat bleaching works incredibly well with this ore body and this project. And that's what makes our project work. I'll just show you this one slide. This is the World Nuclear Association's demand and supply for uranium projections. And what we've done with this slide is we've simplified it for the audience. All of the secondary supply, primary supply existing, the new mines that are coming back, uh, the new mines coming onto production, the mothballed mines coming in, the development prospective planned mines, including a tango, are in that teal colour, dare I say it. They're in the teal colour. You can see that this sector is going to be enjoying good times for a long time from now. 
And Tango is perfectly positioned not only with our initial three and a half million pounds, but also to deliver an expanded case production into that gaping hole that we expect to be well supported by market prices. So corporate snapshot, we've got a market cap as we stand today of about a bit over 400 million Australian dollars. So relate that back to a 225 million pound resource of advanced shovel ready production. And you can see the value proposition that we're dealing with here. We've got a strong board. Uh, we've got almost $40 million in cash with no debt. So we're as strong as you could possibly be in this situation. So what are the investment highlights? As an investor on ASX looking at a you know, wonderful array of uranium projects that we've seen today, what makes Bannerman stand out? So look, first of all, it's a strong technical and commercial viability. I'll talk to the numbers in a moment. We're highly conventional, we're technically de-risked, we've operated a pilot plant. We have all of our environmental approvals in place. Um, we've got all of the ESG buckets boxes ticked and we filled the sustainability buckets well. And uh, we've got a skilled delivery team that will deliver a global impact with our project. So let's break down quickly. So first of all, our DFS was for an 8 million tonne development. If you've followed Bannerman for a while, if you've followed Bannerman at least as long as I've been CEO, which happens to be a long while, uh, you might remember that we were developing a really big version of a tango. It was 20 million tonnes to produce 7 million pounds. Now, if you have, if you're only back to the story recently, I'd like you to know that we've focused on an 8 million ton throughput development. It's at a head grade of 240 ppm. Namibia is known for successfully delivering low grade bulk tonnage mines. And what makes our project absolutely sing is that the heat bleaching works exceptionally well, as proven by five years of pilot plant. So it's a 15 year initial mine life. We'll you know, obviously move a lot of material. It's a bulk tonnage mine. We get exceptionally good recovery for a heat leaching project in only 22 days of leaching. Average production initially three and a half million pounds. That comes out to the cash cost of $35 a pound and it will need a pre-production capital of $317 million US. Chris, I'm gonna ask for your microphone in a moment because I feel like every time I say something really critical, we drop out. We kill. Okay, not going to get any feedback. Okay, this is, oof. That's uh, made me sound even deeper. Well, hello. <laughs> okay, all right, we're back in comms, ladies and gentlemen. So, what does that mean? What do those figures mean for you as an investor and the returns that you can expect? So, we ran a base case at $65. Not because I'd changed my mind, Chrissy, on the $80, but because that is what we did the scoping study and the PFS at. So we needed the analyst to be able to compare. And that produced a reasonable re return in terms of a post-tax NPV over 200 million US and an acceptable IRR of 17% post-tax. What we also did, true to our level of commitment about this sector, is Back in December, when uranium was trading below $50, we put out an $80 a pound upside case. What you can see from that is a dramatic uplift in the economics. So the cash flow goes up post-tax by 70%. The post-tax NPV more than doubles. Payback goes down. IRR starts to return a very healthy 24.6%. Now, what you need to understand is there aren't a lot of analysts who are stopping at $80 a pound right now. And every single dollar that you add to that goes straight to our bottom line. So that makes us, for a $400 million company, exceptionally well leveraged with all of the development risk up to construction taken out of this project. So that's what seems to be resonating with investors at the moment. Second one, as we talked about, it's a conventional production, technically de risk That's a picture of our demonstration plant that you can see there. Environmental approvals, and there's obviously a lot of them, they've all been received. We have a mining license in application at the moment at an advanced stage of consideration. So watch out for that one. 
And as I said before, both the concept of uranium mining and our company with a long history of outstanding community relations is very well supported in country. That's because of an enormous amount of CSR or ESG or community development work, a baseline environmentally that goes back since 2008. And in fact, that culminated in us winning the 2023 African Mining in Daba ESG Forum Award, um, which quite frankly is a really big deal, something we're really proud of. So lots made of talent and skill availability in our sector. The people on that screen there know big projects, they know Namibia, they know uranium, and they know what they're doing in this sector. A couple of highlights. Mike Leach was the managing director of Rossing Uranium Mine when that was the largest uranium mine in the world. Gavin Chamberlain isn't phased at all by 317 million pre-production capital. He was the project director that built the Husab uranium mine in Namibia, and that was more than a $2 billion development. So he kind of feels pretty comfy about a tango and he's got the experience set to match that attitude. Werner Evolt was the mining manager at Rossing for many years. He's based in Namibia as well as Mike Leach. Steve Hurley, he was the financial controller globally for BHP Iron Ore. And Olga Skolyakova has been in the nuclear sector. She's done everything from selling enrichment into the US to running the nuclear fuel report for the World Nuclear Association. I've done a few things in the sector as well. So finally, what makes our project special on the global stage? Why do utilities in particular want to talk to us? So at three and a half million pounds, as investors, you can tell your grandkids, present or perhaps future for some of us, that uh, that's enough to feed six to eight full-size conventional nuclear power plants. Now, if they replace coal mining, that's 25 million tonnes per annum of coal that's displaced, which in carbon equivalency uh, saves the planet 64 million tonnes every year, every year during its operating life. And of course, at a local level, we are creating a whole host of jobs in Namibia. So the last slide, where are we at at the moment? We're currently concentrating on contracting and financing. That will give us the ability to move through construction into production. And then, as I said, we've got the unique position of having a product, a project pipeline built into a Tango with an expansion case. So I'm really looking forward to being here next year when the uranium price is probably going to be three figures. And as I say, that's a great time to be alive as a uranium CEO. It's an even better time to be alive as the CEO of a uranium company that's shovel ready and absolutely poised to deliver into a uranium market that's on fire at the moment. Thanks for coming down. I love it. I love the way the excitement is slightly internalised there as he stands on the stage. Now, remember not to leave the room, Brandon, because you're coming back to moderate the power panel session in a little while as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to welcome up to the stage Stacey Golican, Director of Investor Relations from Next Gen Energy. Professionally, she helps investors to navigate uranium's role in the green energy landscape. Personally, she attempts to land on the green in golf for birdie. Today, she is here to tee up a very exciting discussion about Next Gen's incredible journey and their vision for a brighter future for us all. Would you please make her welcome? Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, just a caveat: I do play golf, albeit very badly. So, if anyone has any tips to get out of the bunker in less than six shots, come see me at the after the event. Um, so, Next Gen Energy, we are a Canadian uranium exploration and development company. We're triple listed on the TSX, the NYSC, and the ASX. And our flagship asset is the Arrow Deposit at our Rook One project. Our company was founded in 2010 by our CEO, Lee Courier, who's been in the industry for decades. And in 2011, the team picked up a significant land package in the southwest of the Athabasca Basin, an area known to be super rich in uranium. The team set about exploring and on the 21st drill hole on Valentine's Day 2014, 
we discovered Arrow and what a Valentine's Day gift this was. Arrow has since been regarded as the world's largest, lowest cost, high grade uranium deposit under development. And it's also located in one of the best sovereign locations for developing a uranium mine, the premier mining friendly jurisdiction of Saskatchewan, Canada. Now, what makes Arrow unique is its geotechnical setting, which lends itself to some pretty robust, compelling economics, but also some pretty great environmental outcomes. So Arrow has these vertically stacked veins of high grade uranium that's all hosted within extremely competent crystalline basement rock. So it lends itself to conventional bulk mining methods. Arrow also only has about one to 200 metres of glacial till, so ground freezing is only required for shaft sinking. Once the casing is in, underground workings and cavities are developed, we can let the freezing go. There's no more required for the life of the project. This is significant because unlike all the other uranium uh, mines that are hosted in the sandstone, as they're in that wet, unconsolidated rock or in the porous rock, ground freezing is constantly and continuously required in order to access the ore body. If the ground freezing is not maintained, the entry points to the ore body can collapse on itself pretty quickly. So as you can imagine, this process of constant and continuous ground freezing is laborious and costly. Um, and what you also find in these sandstone hosted deposits is quite complex metallurgy. As there's been water going through the ore body over millions of years, this can result in high levels of arsenic and other deleterious materials that have to be dealt with once you get that ore to surface. Arrow doesn't have these aspects. As it's in that competent basement rock, there's been negligible water ingress going through the ore body meaning that we have exceptionally clean metallurgy. So we have a relatively straightforward method of extraction and we have a relatively straightforward processing circuit. So we have easier mining conditions compared to all the other uranium mines that are hosted in the sandstone. And we have exceptionally high grades with over 60% of our measured indicated at 17% grades or 170 times the average. These aspects all become big differentiators, leading to a lower capex and opex compared to all the uranium mines hosted in the sandstone. Arrow has nearly 340 million pounds in resources, the ability to produce 30 million pounds of uranium annually over an 11 year mine life. At an operating cost of $10 a pound and based on our 2021 feasibility study, at a spot price of $75 a pound, we're going to generate over a billion and a half dollars in free cash flow and have a pretty quick payback period of less than a year. As our costs are so low, we go into production under any pricing cycle. We're also highly generative in all pricing environments. So if you look at this chart, at a spot price of $75 a pound, we're going to generate $2.5 billion in EBITDA. At a spot price of $150 a pound, we're going to generate over $5 billion in EBITDA. Even if the spot price doesn't continue to escalate, we're still going to generate sub $2 billion. And based on free cash flow alone, once we're in production, we're on our way to becoming a top 10 world mining company. Another thing that's worth mentioning is because our costs are so low and because of our technical setting, we have the ability to flex production up and down in line with market conditions. And because of this, we're going to adopt a volume based contracting approach referencing spot prices at the time of delivery. We want to be 100% levered to the uranium price as we believe spot prices will continue to go up and we don't want the flaws associated with price based contracts. Another great feature of the Arrow deposit is that we're going to be one of the world's smallest mines with the entire surface expression fitting inside the MCG and surrounding car park. We're also only going to move about 1300 tonnes of rock a day. So to put that in a visual perspective, 
that's about the size of this room. So this um, elite environmental performance of a mine is as a result of the technical setting, but also some design parameters. From the very beginning, we designed the mine with mine closure and thoughtful reclamation in mind. As we're in that basement rock, we're able to build purpose-built tailings chambers underground and return the tailings underground sequentially throughout the mine life. This revolutionary underground tailings management facility and our small footprint has certainly helped with our permitting pathway as our mine design prioritizes environmental preservation and ensures minimal disruption to the local ecosystems and wildlife. And as you can imagine, this has resonated very strongly with local communities and our regulators. On the topic of regulators, we just received our provincial environmental assessment approval a few weeks ago. This is huge. This is a major milestone for the company and a huge de-risking event. Also, this is the first time a greenfield uranium project has been approved in Saskatchewan since the 1990s. It's the first time a uranium project has been approved that is 100% independently owned and non-government owned. And it's also been one of the most efficient times to approval with regards to costs and time. And it took a lot of work to get here. So from the very beginning, the team had the forethought to proactively seek out the support of the Indigenous communities local to the project site. They sought to understand their interests and build trusting and meaningful relationships. And they did this by um, managing expectations, being transparent and following through on commitments. So since 2011, NextGen has incorporated the Indigenous through as many jobs and contracts as reasonably possible. We've proactively sought out their cultural studies around land use and incorporated that into the mine design. We've implemented numerous and various programs that include, but are not limited to, uh, training, youth mentorship, summer school and scholarship programs, and various sports partnerships. As a result, these commitments have resulted in a historic environmental impact statement for Canada. We have signed industry-leading impact benefit agreements with the Mati, the Clearwater River Dene, the Birch Narrows Dene, and the and the Buffalo River Dene Nations. That's 100% support from the Indigenous communities local to our project site. This is unheard of in mining, and it's something that the team at NextGen is so incredibly proud of building. As a testament to the trust and collaboration built by the team, Indigenous leaders from these communities have also been proactively advocating for our project in the Federal Government of Canada and the Parliament of Saskatchewan in support of our licensing. As the team recognised the critical need and opportunity in expediting this project, we ran both the provincial and federal processes simultaneously from the beginning. Now that we have our provincial environmental assessment approval, we are laser focused on advancing and acquiring the federal approvals required for this project. This includes the federal environmental assessment and licensing approvals from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. We're hoping to receive these federal approvals in the first half of 2024, with chiefs from the Indigenous nations having already re uh, requested for our commission hearing date and uh, that the project be approved as soon as possible. So what's happening at site? We continue to move forward with our site infrastructure and confirmation program. The program is now 60% complete with engineering 100% complete and procurement 85% complete. We're hoping to award the shaft sinking contracts in the next few months and complete this program in 2024 with the local priority area playing a significant role as they're going to be making up most of the workforce. Currently, 54% of all current employees are from the province of Saskatchewan and 82% of all current site employees are from the local priority area. So very strong representation from the local communities in our workforce. There's a lot of activity going on up at site. We've expanded and upgraded the accommodation camp. We've upgraded a bridge. We've cleared shaft pads. We've drilled freeze holes and we continue to make 
uh, various site access improvements. The team at NextGen is laser focused on bringing the RUC1 project into production by the end of the decade. And we can't wait. And the world can't wait. As we've all observed, uh, the support for nuclear, particularly over 2023, has been dramatic. This year alone, we've heard China commit to build 150 reactors over the next 15 years. India has 20 something operable reactors with plans to triple that by 2040. Saudi Arabia is building two reactors. Sweden's building 10 reactors. There's even been the establishment of the International Bank of Nuclear Infrastructure, which will seek to assist with financing new nuclear builds. Very strong support globally, significant uh, political tailwinds, supportive global policy and increased investor interest. And it is a really exciting time to be in the uranium industry, but it's a trepidatious time globally, given the convergence of the climate crisis and the energy crisis. Arrow, once in production, is going to be responsible for 25% of the world's uranium supply. That's the ability to power 46 million homes of the homes in the US, whilst removing 70 million car equivalents of CO2 annually. It's a beast of a resource, a unicorn of a project. To the best of my knowledge, I don't believe there's another project in the resource space that will have this ability. But it's not going to be enough. The supply deficit is widening and will continue to widen. This year alone, we've seen increasing concerns around security of supply, given the concentration of supply in the current geopolitical situation. We've seen, <laughs> we've seen um, scarcity of new mine supply, given long lead times on greenfield projects and the complexity of permitting a uranium mine. And the fact that while uranium is not a scarce commodity, Western producers require higher ur uranium prices than what we have now before they become economically viable to NextGen wants to do its part to ensure that there's strong Western diversification of uranium supply and we want to ensure that uranium is used responsibly. We're going to do this by sticking to these commitments above and we hope that all those in the industry will join us in making these commitments. We encourage all investors, both prospective and existing, to not only support our project, but the project of our peers, especially given that uranium is such a key fuel to ensuring energy for the future. Thank you guys. If you have any questions, please come find me in the foyer. Thanks. That was ridiculously time perfect. Thank you, Stacey. Now, can you stay here on, on, the, on the stage with us because you are gonna be part of our panel. Can I call up Dave Franklin? and Greg Cochran from Aurora to join us as well, please. And Brandon from Bannerman, I'm handing this microphone. You've got your own microphone, you don't need mine. I will move off the stage. This is our power session. Now, remember what I said about oh, two and a half hours ago or so. I said, we've got some drinks for you out there, Richard. And what did you have to do, Richard, to get those drinks? You had to be? Yeah, yeah that's right. So I'm going to go outside now like a school mother and I'm going to go and check and see where these other naughty children are and send them in here and if they're not, I'm going to put a little cross on them and, and we all get the first drinks and the first bits of food. Does that sound fair to you? Yes? Even you Falcon supporters, are you happy with that? Good on you, mate. All right. So we're aiming to close by about five, but are you all all right if we run five, ten minutes over if we're enjoying the conversation? All right, I'm going to stand at the back with my microphone. So if you've got any questions and you feel like you'd throw that to the panel, you're in charge. So you just get me to run around with the mic, okay? Would you please make our panel welcome, everyone? Thanks, Chrissy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what a fine way to finish our power session. We're going to run this panel a little bit differently to what you might normally see. This is a little bit like sublime industry knowledge meets thrill sports meets in pro theatre. <laughs> I've got them nervous, you know, that's a state that what we want them in excitable. <laughs> so first of all, let's introduce our panel. So Greg Cochran, he's a man that uh, the last time that we saw each other in Namibia, we ended up having a colonial coffee together. So Namibian aff aficionados ask Greg about the, yeah, we've got a couple in the background going, oh. the and coffees. the next question is, did he survive? And 
<laughs> it depends how you define survive, but he was breathing the next day. So Greg, in one breath, one breath, please tell us about your background. Okay, uh, a lapsed mining engineer that's passionate about uranium and what the impact of uranium can have on global emissions and really securing secure, uh, sorry, energy supply. And I can play a role in that with my background and dealing with some of the largest transactions in uranium history. Uh, that's your breath. Thank you very much. Um, most of you were in the room and you heard Greg talk a little bit about his extensive background in the resources sector and the uranium industry, of course. We'll touch on that in a little while. Uh, we've just heard from Stacey, Stacey Golikin, who is uh, relatively new to NextGen and the sector. So Stacey, again, you've got one breath, make it count. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to being in NextGen. Yeah, so I've spent most of my career at Newcrest Mining and I basically live and breathe um, sustainable life. I'm a vegetarian, I drive a Tesla. So when the opportunity for um, working at NextGen came up, I thought this will fit in with my whole life ethos. So I've now been at NextGen since uh, end of August. Great, well, it's great to have you in the sector. And finally, we started the day after Jackson introduced the day, of course, with Dave Franklin, who gave what I thought was an excellent roundup about the uncertainties that we have in the world, but also how as investors we're uniquely positioned to mitigate those through some sensible investment decisions. Uh, David, in one breath, can you give us your background prior to Argonaut and how you came to be lucky enough to sit around all day and make such good forecasts and predictions? Um, yeah, thanks, um, Brandon. So, so my background is, is very financial. So I was um, uh, firstly in stockbroking as head of research for uh, Hartley Poynton um, uh, a little while ago, then managed a small companies fund for about a decade, had a bit of um, time in industry, worked in a uh, mining service company for about five years, and then came to, to Argonaut. All right, now what we've got here is some fantastic diversity of thinking, and that's what we're going to tap into today. Start preparing your questions. Chrissy will be very disappointed if she can't get her step counter up, moving around the room with her microphones, and we'll come to a couple of opportunities to ask the questions of the audience in just a moment. But first of all, we're going to play some games. I told you it was going to be different. We're going to start with a game called Name Your Price. Now, two of our panellists have got an advantage here because we played this game on the big stage at the Global Uranium Conference in Adelaide last week. So, and I know that Greg and Stacey were in the audience making copious notes, no doubt. The disadvantage is I remembered what was said because I was on the stage and you're not allowed to copy anyone. All right. So the way we play this, ladies and gentlemen, is this is a question to our panellists, theoretically, about where could prices go? I'm not going to be so mean as to make them write on a piece of paper what date, what price, you know, what bet, that sort of stuff, and bring it back next year. This is a theoretical discussion that they will not be held accountable to, but we want their ideas. Get it? Yeah? Okay, cool. So the first question is, what is the theoretical limit on a uranium spot price? Now, what I mean by that is not, well, you know, what could you write on a piece of paper, but theoretical limit in terms of there's a chance, let's call it a 5% chance. In other words, there's a one in 20 chance that the world could find itself at this theoretical limit. So Greg, I'm gonna start with you. What's the theoretical limit for uranium? Just give us the price and we'll come back to digging in later. Okay, yep. uh, 200. Okay, Stacey? 300. All right. Do we have a bid on 300, David Franklin? Well, I'm the one that's not in the uranium industry. Uh, so, um, so, and I'll, I'll take a step back before I go forward, and that is one of the philosophies we have in investing is um, is we try not to predict, you know, we try to observe and then react. It's not a prediction, we're just looking <laughs> for ideas and thoughts. Uh, so I'll go 150. Wow. Okay. Um, and no one even booed. This is a pretty polite crowd. Um, Stacey, talk us through $300. Why, why wouldn't it go higher than that? 
Oh, uh, look, I'm I'm a pretty um, bullish investor when it comes to uranium, and I also work for Next Gen Energy, which has one of the great um, best resources um, at the moment. And I just feel the way that the market is going, the supply challenges, the complexity in permitting uranium mine, next gen, um, we've reached the provincial step of permitting and we've done it faster than anyone else in history, I believe, and it's still taken nine to 10 years to get here. So I think that even if more resources were to come online, it'll be at least a 10 to 15 year time period. So I feel like the price has a lot, to move, a lot of room to move in that time period. Okay, great. Well, let's ask the next question, which is, what's a practical limit for the uranium spot price? Now, what we're thinking here is not what's possible if, you know, all of the planets align in a particular way, but more so, you're sitting there as investors, you're obviously thinking about where this sector's going to go. If you're a good investor, you've got a staged exit strategy according to different price targets. David, what should an investor, and again, we're not asking for a forecast, yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. it's just an idea. Yeah. Where should investors be thinking as a practical limit? Like when they get to that limit, they should be thinking, wow, that's what, that's what I thought all the way back in 2023 would be the limit. Um, again, I'm, I'm kind of plucking numbers here, right? So, um, you know, I'd go, it's something like 120. Um, but, but what I would highlight is uh, you, you got to look at the situation at that point in time. And uh, um, in, in all likelihood, if it's gone to 120, uh, there could be further upside there. It will depend on the penetration to the market, et cetera. So, so wait and see, but uh, I think 120 is probably a fair start. Okay, so sage advice. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're forming your own view on where the spot price could go, write down the assumptions, date it, sign it, send a picture of it to social media so it's out there time stamped and then review those assumptions because every chance that it goes through 120 and we're all having a similar discussion that we are today about how much higher it's going to go greg number yeah look i probably would have come to a number quite similar to that 120 to 150 and the reason why it's so that i'd come at it from a mineral economics point of view uh, if you think back to the last genuine uh, sustainable what was seen as sustainable at the time price rise uh, up to the mid 40s in the early 1980s and you then escalate that that mid 40s you're getting to the 200 250 dollar a pound range but that was contract prices that wasn't spot when you think about the most recent spot high uh, in 2008 of 132 odd dollars a pound. The reality is that was a 30,000 pound transaction, which is a drop in the ocean in 180 million pound a year market. So yes, spot drives investment in interest and, and incentivizes investors. But the reality is at the end of the day, we realize they just the little cream on the top of your cappuccino or uh, of your colonial coffee. Um, whereas the reality is being transacted at the contract level. Okay, Stacey, number for you? Yeah, I agree. Um, I believe 100 to 120 is a good, good reasonable figure. Okay, well, it'd be unfair if I didn't have a crack, right? Yeah? All right, here's the thing. In the 1970s, we had a very similar setup to what we have today. In those days, it was called the oil crisis. Today, it's called the energy security crisis. Both involve wars. Both involve a fundamental rethinking about how we do energy. In those days, it was to get away from uh, Middle Eastern oil. Today, it's to get away from carbon dioxide. Inflation adjusted. The sector spent seven to eight years during the 70s at a price in today's dollars of over $200 a pound. I don't see any reason why the sector can't support that today. I'm not saying it's a forecast, but I'm just saying on fundamentals, think about that. Now, to Greg's point, during the last little boom, which was pretty frothy for those of us, myself included, who played at that stage, nonetheless, even though it was only £30,000 that hit the peak, for nine months, the term contract price traded at $95 a pound in those days which translates to above $120 a pound in today's money. So that's a couple of things just to think about as investors when you're evaluating, has the party finished now that we've hit $80? Okay, let's move on. The incentive price during this decade to bring on enough production, which really means greenfields production 
to fill the supply gap. Not the 2030s and the 2040s and the 2050s when things could get crazy, but this decade. Let's start with Stacey. Yeah, I think above 85, 90. Okay, 90, thank you. As in contract. Yeah, let's, let's call it contract. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think we're, we're getting to that point now where definitely anything from the 80s to the 100 and just inside the 100 as a, as a, uh, at the top end with escalators built into it is a very reasonable objective and a target. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a clever panel move. <laughs> you hear the with escalators. So if he gets it wrong, he said, yeah, but I'm meant to 19% per annum escalator, right? Okay. Uh, I'd go 85, 90, that kind of range. Okay, all right, good. Good way of thinking about it. What's interesting is I had a conversation this morning with a journalist, I won't name him, and he said, yeah, you know, a few years ago, everyone was talking about a $60 incentive price. And I said, Michael, that's bullshit because it was not a $60 incentive price back in those days. The economics were exactly the same with a bit of inflation that they are today. I'm not saying that he was talking horseradish. I'm just saying that the concept that it was a $60 uranium price in those days, I did not believe then, and there was no grounds for believing it. And of course, we've sailed through $60, we're now at $80, and we haven't seen a single Greenfields production pound come in yet. And inflationary prices are so much higher. Great point. Okay, how's everyone going? Everyone feeling comfy? Enjoying the format? Yep, no one's too thirsty? Don't answer that question, please. <laughs> Good, all right. Well, at so, least this time I'm not paying for the drinks I was last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's move on. The next thing we're gonna do is play the ratings game. So this is how this game works. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask our esteemed panelists to rate a series of statements based on one, slong, strongly disagree, and 10, strongly agree. You've all done these surveys, right? They're horribly boring. Every so often you forget to read which is which and you, you know, end up at the wrong end of the spectrum. Now, what I've found, having two daughters who love to play the ratings game with me, is they tend to linger on seven. You know, seven is where you go when you're too lazy to think about it. So we're ruling out seven. You cannot say seven. You either need to be committed enough to go an eight, nine or 10, or you have to be right on the fence and call it six to five. Understood? Okay, and I want you in the audience, I'd like you to think in your own mind, where do I sit on these questions? First question, we're getting controversial. In uranium, jurisdiction is more important than all body. It's not a definitive statement, so you know we can unpack. And what I'm asking for, esteemed ladies and gentlemen of the panel, I'm asking for your answer, not your disclaimers, not your sort of prelude comments and not your value judgments. Just the answer. I'll decide who I ask the questions of. Got it? All right. Stacey. Eight. Greg? I'm there as well. I, it was a tough one, but absolutely. Eight. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to say eight too, so I'm out. All right. <laughs> well, there's nothing to discuss there, but as, as we know at the moment, if you've got a beautiful ore body in a country that doesn't allow uranium, you don't have an investment. I would also say eight. Let's move on. Generalist investors have already entered the uranium sector. Now, this is a really important question for those of you sitting in the audience wondering where this sector could go. If we've already seen generalist investors come in and start pouring money in, then you might be looking at a few equities prices thinking, whoa, they're pretty, they're pretty well priced. I've got David's views on you know, NPV multiples and all this type of thing, and it looks a bit fully valued. If we haven't even seen the generalist investors, well, no one's even given us the date for the party, let alone told us what sort of outfits we're supposed to wear. So what, I'm gonna start with you, Stacey, because you're probably best positioned to advise on generalist investors, because unlike Many of us, you haven't sort of been immersed in the sector, you know, not even realising that there's a big bad world out there. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll come back for comments. What's your rating? Six. Five and a half, sorry. Five and a half. Thank you. Thank you. We like precision here, ladies and gentlemen. Greg? Uh, four. Okay. Yeah, I'd go three. All right, cool. I'm on a two for what it's worth. 
Um, Stacey, so you say six, so you're obviously seeing quite a bit of interest. Do you think that could be because you're representing a company with a four-ish billion dollar market cap and they're far more likely to get, you, you'd be getting the generalist investors first? That's correct. A lot of my conversations have been with um, generalist investors, so yes. And are they asking about the sector or are they buying the sector? Both. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good, good sign. Good sign. Let's move on. Spot price is more important to equity investors than term price. Now, to define equity investors, hello. So the question is, and I'm going to start with you, David, is spot price more important or is term price? Sorry, the, the yeah, statement yeah. is spot price is more important. Where do you sit on the ratings game? Yeah, I, I would go eight. I think that is right. Greg? Yeah, absolutely. Eight. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Stacey? Seven and a half. <laughs> I think we're going to have to call a friend on that. If, if seven's illegal, is seven and a half pushing the boundary? Or is that really eight minus half and we're allowing it? Okay, thank you. You've got a friend there, Stacey. Well done. Yeah, so it's an interesting topic because we all know that in some respects, the spot price is illusory, right? Because it doesn't really mean anything to a financing of a project the way that financiers look at it. However, it's a pretty opaque sector, and as investors, you've got to run on something. And the thing that does have good visibility these days is the spot price. So I think we're all in furious agreement there. Now we're going to move to play yes or no. But before we do that, is, uh, is Chrissy there? Great. Thank you, Chrissy. So do we have any audience questions? Anyone want to get in first? Anyone want to be the worldwide premiere of a question for this particular event? Yeah, Xiong Chang is my name. Here is a quiz, 1986 and 2016. Those that were born before 1986 probably don't know, 1986 was Chernobyl and 2016 was Fukushima. 2011. Uh, sorry, 2011. 2016 right, is right, when the right, world right. found out that no one died at Fukushima. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, all it takes is just one 1986 or 2011 before uh, the price crashes. Yeah. So my question to you, would that be the same if it happened today? Brilliant question. Who, who wants to launch off on that? Uh, let me give it a go. I, I, I think it it's a really is a, a very good question. And, and you know, these, these black swan events in all industries can create absolute havoc. I think the, the world has got to a different place today in terms of the realization of those key elements around why we are now turning back to nuclear, energy security, uh, you know, clean, green energy. Um, that means that people will be more selective as how they decide on which path to go if there is another nuclear disaster. So you had these weird outcomes. You had Germany, Angela Merkel, realizing that she was facing a by-election in Baden-Württemberg in a few months' time, and she had just lost to the Greens in her state, and so she banned nuclear power. It had nothing to do with Fukushima or the fact that there may be an earthquake or a tsunami in Germany, patently not. It was purely politics. It's exactly the same situation we face here in Australia. So. Moving the politics aside, people be more selective in saying, oh, all bets are off with nuclear, we can't go there again, or hang on a minute, let's get realistic. This is a one in 1,000 year earthquake. Let's uh, tackle the problem uh, differently in terms of continuing with the nuclear vault. It would slow down, definitely. Did anyone want to add something to that? No? Okay. Um, I, I would. I, I think it's a really good point, and I think um, you know, what I look at when I'm building a portfolio is the risk in the portfolio. And so, and so I, I probably wouldn't go as, uh, as big into the sector just because of, because of that. And, and I think there's the black swan events like, um, um, you know, weather or, or et cetera, but there's also the, the weaponization of potentially nu nuclear plants. Um, and you just got to look at what's happening in Russia and, and Ukraine, right? So, um, and I think that would have a massive impact on, on the industry. So I think there is some risk, but um, I also think there's, there's, there's good potential upside. Thanks. And I might just add to that. There's a, 
you know, when you're looking at risks, you've got probability and consequence, and you can only really judge a risk if you're evaluating both of them. What I'd say we're looking at is a very low probability, high consequence potential. Uh, so would you not invest in uranium because of that? I'd say no, there's a dozen broader macro events that are equally as probable that it could affect the whole of your portfolio, including uranium. But because of the consequence, as an investor, you need to have a plan as to how you react if that risk comes to be, in the same way you should have a plan if a meteor hits the earth. Okay, another question. Um, Doug from All Product Supplies. I would just like to sort of a, a double-edged question, and that is that there's improved safety with nuclear plants, particularly with the smaller plants, and also there's been the you know the oil lobby and a lot of people that have demonised uh, atomic energy to the point where uh, we are now facing a critical um, climate change event, uh, and the gap between renewables. Will, will it ever catch up or ever keep up with nuclear? Because to me, I think the nuclear is the solution to, to bridge that gap, gap of ba base power. Stacey, would you like to have a crack at that question? So how does the gap close between nuclear power and renewable energy? Yeah, it's all about um, public support, public acceptance issues, particularly in Australia. You know, um, we are seeing our energy prices skyrocket. Um, people are being plunged into energy poverty. In Finland, um, their wholesale energy prices have gone down 75% since they brought their new reactor online in April. In Canada, 15% um, of their energy comes from nuclear power and their energy bills are a third of ours. So it absolutely needs to happen, particularly in Australia. And the only way forward is just supportive um, green policies within um, instilled by government. Great, okay. Last question before we resume our game show. Um, yeah, Graham Rook, uh, First Nation Engineering. Uh, just a, uh, turning the question back around to the moderator, Brendan. Um, you mentioned your Namibia project as a um, heat bleach, uh, which has already um, uh, got a pilot plant. Is that going to be cheaper, quicker, and um, uh, uh, most suitable to a particular jurisdiction? Would that start addressing the gap between the current uh, supply and demand? Yeah, heat bleaching is a really interesting one, and I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll really welcome any additional comments from the panel here. Heat bleaching is absolutely brilliant when it works. It's a little bit like in situ recovery. It's great when it works. If it doesn't work, it just, it just doesn't work, and you can't use it, and you can't force it on an ore body where it doesn't work. So where we're really lucky at Bannerman Energy is the Atango project is made for heat bleaching. And the reason why we invested at a really tough time in the sector in building the demonstration plant is we'd had such good metallurgical results in the lab that quite frankly, we didn't think financiers and investors would believe us unless we demonstrated it at an industrial scale. And because it either works really well or fails badly, there is a litany of heat bleaching projects around the world in various commodities that haven't worked and have dragged companies under with them. So I could answer that at length. Maybe we can talk to each other at the booth or something. Um, anyone, you know? I, I thought that was a, a, a classic comparison with ISR, I, exactly. So when I permitted honeymoon and I was running two joint ventures in Kazakhstan uh, for Uranium One, so all exclusively ISR, in order to make that point and, and, and just stress the risks involved, the operational risks involved with the nature of those sort of deposits. And it, the, the term I coined was that it is deceptively simple. And I think the same holds true for, for, for heat bleach is that, as Brandon said, you get it right, you're, you're home and dry. But gosh, if you get it wrong, trying to figure out what's going on in the heap and resolving that issue is a major challenge. Right, okay, that was an excellent intermission of questions. Sometimes we have to tease it out of people, but we've obviously got a very engaged audience. The next thing we're gonna play is yes or no. I think you can all figure this out for yourself. I'm gonna ask the panelists to say yes or no to a series of statements. And if anyone says anything weird, I'm gonna pin them on it, right? So the first one, Australia will remove the ban on nuclear power 
And here's the key, by 2028. Now, before anyone starts trying to find wriggle room in this, I mean the end of 2028. 11.59, 31 December, 2028. Stacey, yes or no? I'm gonna be optimistic and say yes. Thank you, Greg? Yes, look, I'm on public record of saying this uh, in my lifetime to Alan Kohler in a TV interview in 2006. So I'll stick to, stick to that and say, I should still be on the planet in 2028, so all things being considered, so yes. Well, I hope you will. <laughs> I'm a yes as well. All right, great. What, is, what do people think in the audience? If you're a yes, I want you to cheer. If you're a no, you have to boo. Everyone get it? Okay, one, two, three. Yes. Pretty evenly split, but there was a bit more enthusiasm behind the yeses, I think. People haven't really found their booing voice. You'll get another chance in a moment. <laughs> Next question. SMRs, that stands for small modular reactors, become commercially available by 2030, and we're going at the end of 2030. Commercially available means there's more than one vendor and they are now ready to take orders, not for first of a kind, but someone can write a check saying, we want four of these or something like that. So we're gonna start with you, David. I think it'd be close, but I'll go no. Okay, Greg? Uh, the amount of funding behind the research and the multiple companies involved, I'm gonna say yes. Stacey? I think the regulation required for SMRs, I'm gonna say no. <sighs> okay, and I'm gonna say yes. So we've got a split panel here. Now to the audience, one, two, three. Yes. Yes. Hang on a sec, who's forgotten the rules already? It's either a cheer or a boot. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Ooh, okay, we found our cheering voice, okay. Remember, you people vote, okay? Don't forget that. Okay, the last one, the WA Labor government will allow uranium mining. Now, the point is it's the Labor government, as opposed to waiting until the Libs get back into power. So, we're gonna start with Greg. That's a tough one. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced, I hope, rather than say yes or no. But I suppose then I'm sitting on the fence, so let's say yes. I've just got to think about that. He did say yes eventually, yeah, didn't he? Was that a yes? yes. Okay, good. Um, Stacey, really appreciating that there's, this is a one-word answer. Uh, no. <laughs> David? No. Audience, remember, it's a cheer or a boo. One, two, three. Cheer. I think it was mainly a boo, and what a fine topic to boo about. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, are we, do we have some more questions or do we have beers, Chrissy? It's straight to beers. Okay, first of all, before Jackson, thank you very much. Thanks for being great sports out there, and I'd like you to thank our panelists. It's very brave to come on a panel in this sort of format, and I really mean that. So please thank Stacey Golligan, Greg Cochran, and David Franklin. Okay, just before we break for the drink, sponsored by Argonaut, and thank you, David, and your organisation, and Eddie Rigg, and Glenn, and Wendy and the team at Argonaut, big thanks to Brandon, did an outstanding job, one of the best moderated panel sessions that I've seen, and we've done a fair amount of conferences. And while I all have you all here in the room, I just want to thank particularly Stacey, Greg, Brandon, and any of the, I can see you Richard Homsey there typing on his phone, but all the executives who signed up from the uranium companies. And the reason I wanna make a special mention is we opened the registrations for this conference at the same time we opened the registration for our massive show, the RIU Explorers Conference. In the space of three or four days, I had 175 company booking forms for the Explorers Conference and about 35 for this conference. I've then had 20 companies cancel this conference since then, and I was thinking, this is not gonna survive, we're not gonna make it. But thankfully, the Uranium team jumped on board and they embraced it. And I think that we would all agree that it's been a really informative, entertaining, and new opportunities and great afternoon. So very appreciative to all those Uranium companies, particularly these guys and the others that are sitting in the room that supported this initiative. And we're hoping at Vertical Events and RIU, we can build on that. As I mentioned in the opening address, Stuart McDonald did create the Australian Uranium Conference in 2004, and it had an awesome run until a tidal wave disrupted it slightly. So fingers crossed we can get rid of the no uranium mining in Western Australia 
and all our lithium, iron ore, gold, copper, nickel mines can all be powered by nuclear. 